the Poverty Theory by E.P. Thompson. Uh, this is the second part, so um, we're starting at section 10. We will now discuss structure and process. It is customary at this point to launch into a long disquisition on the diachronic and the synchronic heuristics, but I hope that we may take this as read. However eloquent the disquisition is likely to leave us with the conclusion that both heuristics are valid and necessary. I must make it clear without equivocation that in the argument which follows I am not disputing the necessity for synchronic procedures in social, economic, and on occasion in historical analysis. Such procedures, a general view of a whole society, frozen at a certain moment, or a systematic isolation from the whole of certain selected activities have always been employed by historians, and a glance down the volumes of our trade journals, for example, past and present, or analysis, ESC, or the Economic History Review, will show that specialist synchronic vocabularies have been brought to interrogate history more frequ frequently in the last three decades than at any previous period. Historical materialism offers to study social process in its totality. That is, it offers to do this when it appears, not as another sectoral history, as economic, political, intellectual history, as history of labor, or a social history defined as yet another sector, but as a total history of society in which all other sectoral histories are convened. It offers to show in what determinate ways each activity was related to the other, the logic of this process and the rationality of causation. We need only to state this claim to note two observations which must at once follow upon it. First, historical materialism must, in this sense, be the discipline in which all other human disciplines meet. It is the unitary discipline, which must always keep watch over the isolating premises of other disciplines and the fictional stasis entailed by the freezing of process in yet others, but whose maturity can only consist in its openness towards its summation of the findings of those other disciplines. So history must be put back upon her throne as the queen of the humanities, even if she has sometimes proved to be rather deaf to some of her subjects, notably anthropology, and gullible towards favorite courtiers, such as econ econometrics. But second, and to curb her imperialist pretensions, we should also observe that history, insofar as it is most unitary and general of all human disciplines, must always be the least precise. Her knowledge will never be, in however many thousand years, anything more than proximate. If she makes claims to be a precise science, these are wholly spurious. But, as I have sufficiently argued, her knowledge remains knowledge, and it is attained through its own rigorous procedures of historical logic, its own discourse of the proof. As we have seen, the credentials of historical materialism have, in the last decades, come under sustained and ferocious assault, and this assault has been mounted equally from positions within orthodox bourgeois academic disciplines, epistemology, sociology, etc., from enclaves within the historical profession itself, genuine empiricism, quantitative positivism, etc., and from a Marxist structuralism. And as with epistemology, what distinguishes all these attacks and what should be taken note of by Marxist philosophers and sociologists is the similarity of their forms, their modes of argumentation and their conclusions. All commence by questioning the knowability of process as a total logic of change of sets of interrelated activities and even up by tilting the vocabularies of knowledge very heavily, even absolutely, towards synchronic rather than diachronic procedures. The diachronic is waved away as mere unstructured narrative, an unintelligible flow of one thing from another. Only the stasis of structural analysis can disclose knowledge. The flow of events, historicist time, is an empiricist fable. The logic of process is disallowed. 
Before approaching this more closely, I will stand back for a moment and take a historical perspective on this problem. For it seems to me that the rise of structuralism has real roots in historical experience, and that this drift of the modern mind must be seen to be, in some part, a drift of ideology. Structuralism may indeed be seen as the illusion of this epoch, just as evolutionism, progress, and voluntarism have characterized earlier moments in this century. Evolutionism was a natural ideolo ideological confusion within the socialist movement in the decades preceding the First World War. Year by year, with minor setbacks, the movement was gathering force. New adhesions were announced to the international. Trade union and party membership enlarged. More socialist deputies were elected. As Walter Benjamin was to comment, nothing has corrupted the German working class so much as the notion that it was moving with the current. It regarded technological developments as the fall of the stream with which it was moving. From there, it was but a step to the illusion that the factory work which was supposed to tend toward technological progress constituted a political achievement. Marxism was hence infiltrated by the vocabulary and even premises of economic and technical progress, which in Britain meant the vocabulary of utilitarianism and of an evolutionism which borrowed improperly from the natural sciences and Darwinism. In bad times and adversity, and adversity, militants might still uphold their cause by means of an evolutionism, which, as Gramsci showed, was compressed into a kind of determinist stamina. History was on their side, and they would be vindicated in the end. While the First World War offered to this evolutionism a check, the October Revolution gave to it a new and more utopian incarnation. Utopianism, in its customary Marxist denigratory notion, has an astonishing and flourishing reincarnation within Marxism itself in the form of a prettified and wholly fictional projection of the Soviet Union. To outsiders, this utopia was offered as the emblem of their own future history, their own glorious and inexorable future. This evolutionism and its vocabulary persisted, of course, and notably in the former colonial world, where evolution, once again, seemed to be the ally of the militants. I have found the vocabulary, although fiercely disputed, still vigorous among Marxists in India today. But I think that there were ways in which the decade, 1936 to 46, gave to it a sharp check. Marxism and the decisive emergencies of fascist insurgents and of the Second World War began to acquire the accents of voluntarism. Its vocabulary took on, as in Russia after 1917 it had taken on, more of the active verbs of agency, choice, individual initiative, resistance, heroism, and sacrifice. Victory in those emergencies no longer seemed to be in the course of evolution, far from it. The very conditions of war and repression, the dispersal of militants into armies, concentration camps, partisan detachments, underground organizations, even isolated positions, threw squarely upon them as individuals the necessity for political judgment and active initiation. It seemed, as the partisan detachment blew up the crucial railway bridge, that they were making history. It seemed, as the women endured the bombs or as the soldiers stood with their backs to Stalingrad, that history depended on their endurance. It was a decade of heroes, and there were guaveras in every street and in, and in every wood. The vocabulary of Marxism became infiltrated from a new direction, that of authentic liberalism, the choices of the autonomous individual, and perhaps also of romanticism, the rebellion of spirit against the rules of fact. Poetry, rather than natural science or sociology, was welcomed as a cousin. It was all very disgusting, and, as events were to prove, futile. All that it left were the bones of our more heroic brothers and sisters to bleach on the plains of the past under a hallucinated utopian sun. And to be sure, although a small matter, a war, a necessary and historic confrontation, that was won. But I cannot disclaim the fact that my own vocabulary and sensibility was marked by this disgraceful formative moment. 
Even now I must hold myself steady as I feel myself revert to the poetry of voluntarism. It is a sad confession, but I prefer it even today to the scientific vocabulary of structuralism. The vocabulary of voluntarism survived for a little longer. It was done in technicolor in the Soviet epics of the Great Patriotic War. Once again, it survived longest and with most justice and authenticity in the, in the colonial and thence the third world. This or that political or military action against the imperialists could still command heroism, summon up initiatives, demand choices, and be felt as making history. The poetry arose in a late flaring of intensity in Cuba, and as with evolutionism, voluntarism could even coexist with adversity for a little while, for it was only by rebellion against the overwhelming presence of established fact that people could assert their humanity. But in the past two decades, both evolutionism and voluntarism have lost their nerve and have fallen silent, notably in the West. The vocabulary of structuralism has pushed all else aside. And is this now at last the truth, the true Marxist vocabulary restored to the original of Marx? We will examine this in its own terms in a moment, but our historical perspective must be continued until we come closer to our own self-knowledge. Voluntarism crashed against the wall of the Cold War. No account can convey the sickening jerk of deceleration between 1945 and 1948. Even in this country, the Marxist left seemed to be moving with the fall of the stream in 1945. In 1948, it was struggling to survive amidst an antagonistic current. In Eastern Europe, that same sickening jerk stopped the hearts of Masaryk, Kostov, and of Rajk. In the West, our heads were thrown against the windscreen of capitalist society, and that screen felt like a structure. History, so pliant to the heroic will, will in 1943 and 1944, seemed to congeal in an instant into two monstrous antagonistic structures, each of which allowed only the smallest latitude of moment of movement within its operative realm. For more than two decades, each impulse towards independent forward movement within either realm, Hungary 1956, Prague 1968, Chile 1973, has been suppressed with a brutality which has confirmed the paradigm, paradigm of structural stasis. Even in those parts of the third world where the rival structures operate only by diplomatic, economic, and ideological extension, the same field of force has been exerted. Only the immense and enigma enigmatic presence of China has escaped at the cost of self-isolation from the structural stasis. This mutual confrontation of imperial structures is without historical precedent. Not even Christendom and Ottoman Empire confronted each other, save at the rubbing edges, so massively, so watchfully, with such all-pervasive ideological refraction. In the West, the natural flow of social process coagulated to a thin stream of hesitant reformism, each individual reform achieved after immensely disproportionate effort. This, at its best, more often, the regenerated capitalist mode of production simply co-opted and assimilated those reforms, the product of earlier struggles, assigned to them new functions, developed them as organs of its own, or this is how it seemed. For, please note, in moving towards our present time, I have already, as if involuntarily, fallen into the vocabulary of structuralism and reified a process which, however confusedly, was still the outcome of human choices and struggles. For this is my point, the vocabulary of structuralism was given by the seeming common sense, the manifest appearances of three decades of Cold War stasis. And in its most pervasive accents, this has been a bourgeois vocabulary, an apologia for the status quo and an invective against utopian and maladjusted her heretics. By the 1950s, structuralisms, sometimes the product of lonely minds working in prior contexts, were flowing with the stream and replicating themselves on every side as ideology. Psychology was preoccupied with adjustment to normality, 
sociology was adjustment to a self-regulating social system, or within defining heretics as deviants from the value system of the consensus, political theory with the circuits of cephology. In the end, more ambitious and more sophisticated structuralism, structuralisms have come into fashion. The vocabularies of structuralism have been borrowed, not from natural science or from poetry, but now from sociology, now from linguistics and anthropology, and now from the anti-structure of Marx's political economy, the grand race face of Marx. I must guard myself against a misunderstanding. When I speak of vocabularies in this sense, it is very certainly in their sense as ideology. That is, I have argued that in each of these periods, there has been a pressure of real experience, which has seemed to license the adoption of a particular language of social and political analysis, an ideological predisposition towards one vocabulary or another. This ought to put us on our guard. The experiences of the decades before the First World War predisposed minds to adopt the premises in terms of evolutionism. The crisis years of 1917 of, and of 1936 to 46 were, like all revolutionary moments, propitious for the premises and terms of voluntarism and the unprecedented stasis and, in the profoundest sense, historical conservatism. The continuous reproduction of material goods and of ideology within a seemingly closed circuit markedly dispose contemporary markedly dispose contemporary minds towards the premises in terms of structuralism. In this sense, a historian recognizes in structuralism an analogy within the circulatory or clockwork impelled justificatory system of prior societies, and notes that these were generally ancien regime, anxious to validate established power or uh, middle-aged post-revolutionary regimes anxious to consolidate power with an ideological apologia. So a historian confronting structuralism must sniff the air and scent a, con a conservatism. But this sniffing of the ideological air does not end the question. For first, the very fact of this ideological predisposition is itself a kind of guarantee that the ideas in question have some partial correspondence to the historical moment. There was a progress of the labor movement before the First World War. There were heroic initiatives and acts of will between 1936 and 1946. There is a profound sociological conservatism around us on each side today. So that we must recall that ideology has its own kind of truth. And second, an ideological predisposition, predisposition to accept a particular vocabulary does not, of course, in itself expose that language, its premises and terms, to be invalid. That must be the object of a distinct inquiry. One day a conjuncture may arrive when thousands of minds are sim simultaneously predisposed to believe the truth. To be sure, historians know no records of such events. But perhaps with Althusser, this utopian conjuncture has now at last arrived? But let us first, before returning to Althusser, delay to admire another structuralism of our time, albeit one that is a little faded and unfashionable today. It falls to my hand because it happens to be a somewhat rare and audacious exercise, an attempt to replace structure within the historical record and to surmount the system, sorry, and to surmount the most difficult theoretical problem of any such system, the analysis of change through time. Let us first of all move directly to its vocabulary. From the industrial perspective, the cotton textile revolution appears as a dramatic rearrangement of all the factors of production. The revolution originated with a series of dissatisfactions legitimized by the dominant value system of the day. In several sequences of differentiation, the industry emerged with a structure more adequate to meet the demands of the foreign and domestic markets. Such a revolution naturally did not occur in a vacuum. It was initiated by non-economic elements, such as religious values, political arrangements, and social stratification. 
At the same time, the Industrial Revolution in cotton created a source of dissatisfaction, which, when combined with other, with other elements, initiated several sequences of differentiation and other social subsystems. I don't have time here to enter closely into argument with Professor Smelser as to his use of sources, his selection and interpretation of these, nor as to the emptiness of his boxes. I wish now only to point to the reification of process entailed by the very vocabulary of analysis. Systems and subsystems, elements and structures are drilled up and down the pages pretending to be people. Smelser is anxious, anxious to show that social process occurred rationally and in an approved Parsonian fashion. There's a self-regulating social system whose wisdom always appears most apparent if you happen to be at the top of it, governed by a value system, which again is enshrined in the institutions and attitudes of the system's governors, directed to goals legitimized by this value system which, when any major element within it differentiates structurally, is precipitated into disequilibrium, resulting in dissatisfactions, always grossly misunderstood by those at the bottom, who, when they suffer, manifest negative emotion, emotional reactions and unjustified disturbance symptoms. But even these plebeian manifestations of rationality, the system is able to turn to functional account since various superior non-economic elements somewhere at the top of the system, such as political arrangements or superior religious values, or more simply the army and the police, handle and channel these disturbance symptoms, and if the system's organs should flash out a justified signal, devise through several refined steps, new ideas or institutions, which, however, are always devised in forms more wise than those agitated for by the deluded sources of disturbance, thereby bringing to the structurally differentiated system a glorious return and an extraordinary growth of production, capitalization, and profits, which, however, in the end falls short of the goals prescribed by the dominative value system, thereby producing new dissatisfactions which, in turn, I don't know how to ext extricate myself from this sentence since the Parsonian system has indeed unlocked the secret of perpetual motion. In this system, there are no good or evil men, or rather all men are of equally neuter will, their wills surrendered into the inexorable will of social process. They are, or should be, the traeger or supports of that process. The social will is benef beneficent the industry emerged with a structure more adequate to meet the demands of markets. And I have done Smelser an injustice in suggesting that he sees men and women only as inert passengers in this differentiating mechanism of reification. Left to itself, the system would move us all forward to meet the goal of larger markets. But unfortunately, the disturbance sy symptoms of the majority of those being moved are not only unjustified in minor ways, but are often hugely unjustified. They become Luddites, trade unionists, Peterloo and 10 hour men, chartists. They impede the thing society from proceeding smoothly down its thing ways to its thing conclusion. It is fortunate that in contemporary societies, we have sociologists who can, who can explain to the disturbed that their symptoms are unjustified and who can advise political arrangements as to the best means of handling and channeling. We all now know that phenomena which to the uniformed eye or stomach might appear as justified cause for disturbance are in fact manifestations of the ulterior working out of a wisdom thing. And behind this again, one may glimpse an ancient theological form of thought. Every phenomenon must, as an evidence of the divine will, have a function. Of course, the Smalzerian system's pretense of transcending the insertion into history of intention and of norms is wholly specious. We have in this system, at every stage, and at every stage, the imposition of exterior value. This is nowhere more clear than in Smelsner's handling of the value system, whether as generalized concept or in relation to particular social groups such as the handloom weavers. As theory, he proposes this. 
Every social system is governed by a value system, which specifies the nature of the system, its goals, and the means of attaining these goals. A social system's first functional requirement is to preserve the integrity of the value system itself and to assure that individual actors conform to it. This involves socializing and educating individuals, as well as providing tension control mechanisms for handling and resolving individual disturbances relating to the values. This snake has, however, already got its tail deeply into its own mouth. For on the same page, Smelser has told us, a social system is governed by a value system which defines and legitimizes the activities of the social system. Second, these values are institutionalized into regulatory patterns which govern the interaction of the more concrete units. Third, the more concrete units specialize in social subsystems which cluster around functional imperatives governing the social system. But also, on another page, the value system in its own judge and arbiter, or in its own judge and arbitrator, it specifies the conditions under which members of the system could exp or should express dissatisfactions and prepare to undertake change. Values alone lie outside this model of structural differentiation. If they change, they change more slowly, or if they change, they change more slowly than social structure. And this is a separate analytical problem. This is a proper epistemological pudding. The first relation proposed between value system and social system is symbiotic. The social system is governed by the value system, which indeed selects the system's goals. But equally, the social system's first functional requirement is to preserve the integrity of the value system. Hence, value system and social system are mutually supportive but of the two, the first is prior. The first function of the social system is to reproduce in their integrity the values which govern it. This is where the snake got its tail into its mouth. Now it begins to swallow itself, for the social system is also made up of concrete units, not, alas, as yet, people, specialized in social subsystems which cluster around functional imperatives governing the social system. But we have already been informed as to what the first of these functional imperatives is to preserve the integrity of the value system. What is society? It is a value system whose first function is, through the mediation of empty boxes and an ugly terminology, to reproduce its own value system. Who holds these values? If choice appears, who decides which sets of value are the dominant value system? The snake, or what is left of it, for it is now a wriggling knot, has an answer to this too. The value system which is dominant is exactly that which dominates. It is not necessary to go further and say the values of those who hold political, economic, and other institutional, e.g. religious, academic, power, since power has been tabulated somewhere among political arrangements whose function is the attainment of goals selected by the value system. Moreover, the value system itself specifies whether dissatisfactions should or should not arise. That is, it actively inhibits alternative values from arising and provides tension control mechanisms for resolving individual disturbances relating to values. Plop. The snake has disappeared into total theoretical vacuity. It is, of course, a highly conservative vacuity. What what is, what is governs what is, whose first function is to preserve the integrity of isness. <laughs> what dominates has the functional imperative of preserving its own dominance. As presented by Smelser, this structural theory cannot be criticized in terms of alternative theories of process or of close conflict, because the terminology of his theory is so fashioned that such concepts may not at any point be allowed to enter. The vocabulary excludes criticism before criticism can commence. Nevertheless, as I have said, we have in this system at every stage the imposition of exterior value. There was not, of course, in the industrial history which Smelser offers to restructure one dominant value system, but many competing sets of value, 
one of which was dominant only because it was professed by men who held power. The values of poor law commissioners and of paupers, of assistant handloom weaver, weavers commissioners, and of weavers can be subsumed within the same system. And even if we attempt to do so by gesturing at some vague notions like independence, we find that the social system is so structured that what makes for the independence of some men makes for the dependence of others. The social system had no goal, no internalized intentionality, since the men and women within that system pursued opposing goals and intentions. Smelser has simply commenced analysis by assuming his own goal, which is the old one of Weberian rationalization in pursuit of maximum economic growth. Deep within his thing mechanism, masks, masked but still at the controls, is Sombart's entrepreneur, a man of unimpeachable goodwill, whose only motivation is to maximize his own profits, and hence the productive resources of mankind. Here is the prima mobile of the capitalist system, and this is why Smelser's system and its larger pretensions not only outrages the discourse of historical logic, but is, as sociology, only to be understood as a moment of capitalist ideology. As ideology may perhaps be seen as the product of that moment of polarized ideological stasis at the height of the Cold War, which I have already indicated. It was also at this moment that Stalinism afforded a caricature of Marxism, which offered in very different terminology, but with an equally abstracted vocabulary, an identical reification of process, in which a superstructure was reduced to confirming or legitimating a base. This base, Stalin wrote in 1950, is the economic structure of society at a given stage of its development. And the superstructure consists of the political, legal, religious, artistic, and philosophical views of society, and the political, legal, and other institutions corresponding to them. Um, this is a quotation, I'm guessing from Stalin. The superstructure is a product of the base, but this does not mean that it merely reflects the base, that it is passive, neutral, indifferent to the fate of its base, to the fate of the classes, to the character of the system. On the contrary, no sooner does it arise than it becomes an exceedingly active force, actively assisting its base to take shape and consolidate itself, and doing everything it can to help the new system finish off and eliminate the old base and the old classes. It cannot be otherwise. The base creates the superstructure precisely in order that it may serve it, that it may actively help it to take shape and consolidate itself, and that it may actively strive for the elimination of the old, moribund base and its old superstructure. This appears to say uh, what, what is creates, what is whose first function is to consolidate its own isness, and also to clobber whatever was. This is an approximate description of high Stalinism, in which the state was indeed an exceedingly active force, doing everything it could to finish off and eliminate the old base and the old classes. Although historians of the Soviet Union nourish a suspicion that, it's just, that at a certain stage the is of Stalin's superstructure was artificially and in a theoretically improper way creating its own base. This consorts less easily with another of Stalin's remarkable formulations. Here's another quotation from Stalin. The superstructure is not directly connected with production, with man's productive activity. It is connected with production only indirectly through the economy, through the base. The superstructure therefore does not reflect changes of development of the productive forces immediately and directly, but only after changes in the base through the prism of changes wrought in the base by the changes in production, this means that the sphere of action of the superstructure is narrow and restricted. My point is not in these latter days to scrutinize Stalin's credentials as a Marxist theoretician. The present point is to note an identical reification of historical process in both Smelser and in Stalin, entailed in the premises and extending into the vocabulary of analysis both offer, or pretend to offer, history as a process without a subject, both concur in the eviction from history of human agency, 
unless as the supports or vectors of ulterior structural determinations. Both present human consciousness and practices as self-motivated things. There's a further, there is a further point. The explicit concept of history as a process without a subject is a discovery not of Smelser or of Stalin, but of Althusser. And moreover, he proposed that this is the basis of all the analyses in Capital. But we may surmise that the origin of this remarkable insight lay in Stalin's Marxism and Linguistics, a text for which Althusser has always shown unusual respect. We know that Althusser joined the French Communist Party in 1948 and felt himself to be subjectively confronting a great difficulty. A professional philosopher who joins the party remains ideologically a petty bourgeois. He must revolutionize his thought in order to occupy a proletarian class position in philosophy. Uh, that was a quotation from Althusser. I think. Wait, is it from Althusser? I think so, yeah. Um, yeah. In this difficulty, he cut his teeth on Stalin's original contribution to theory, which provided the first shock, which began to dislodge the sectarianism and dogmatism which characterized the communist movement at his initiation. Or so he presents the event in retrospect, a period summed up in caricature by a single phrase, a banner flapping in the void. Bourgeois science, proletarian science. Um, here's another quote from Althusser. Paradoxically, it was no other than Stalin whose contagious and implacable system of government and thought had induced this delirium, who reduced the madness to a little more reason. Reading between the lines of the few simple pages in which he reproached the zeal of those who were making strenuous efforts to prove language a superstructure, we could see that there were limits to the use of the class criterion, and that we had been made to treat science, a status claimed by every page of Marx, as merely the first comer among ideologies. We had to retreat and in semi-disarray return to first principles. It is thus that he presents his own intellectual development, a petty bourgeois initiated into Stalinist dogmatism, but rescued from its uttermost delirium by Stalin. The rescue operation left him precisely with the imminent concept of history as process without a subject, with a reified structuralist vocabulary with an inexorable and mechanical metaphor of basis and superstructure, and with a notion of Marxism as a science which belonged to neither. Althusser has, of course, subsequent to reading Capital, denied that his version of Marxism is a structuralism, even though he allows that the young pup slipped between my legs. The argument, which turns largely upon certain structuralist notions of the com combinatory, is not one which we intend to address. Instead, we will address directly his own text, his vocabulary, its premises, and terms. The critical concept of Althusserian sociological theory is that of a mode of production. Few Marxists will object to this. We think if we are historians of production and of land, dues, rents, property, technologies, markets, capital, wages, and the like. But Althusser assumes all this and posts forward to the essence of the matter, the concept, the arrangement of the terms. On the one hand, the structure, the economic base, the forces of production, and the relations of production. On the other, the superstructure, the state, and all the legal, political, and ideological forms. So far, we have been guided by the firm hand of Stalin, but now we may improve upon him. Marx introduced a new conception of the relation between determinate instances in the structure, superstructure complex, which constitutes the essence of any social formation. Althusser then throws himself into the posture of wrestling for the purity of Marxist science against four antagonists, economism and even techno technologism on one side, humanism and historicism on the other. The relation between basis and superstructure must be verbalized and sophisticated in new ways, 
introducing the concepts of structure and dominance in the last instance determination and overdetermination. Marx gives us two ends of the chain. On the one hand, determination in the last instance by the economic mode of production. On the other, the relative autonomy of the superstructure and their specific effectivity. Um, that's a quote. Strictly speaking, these are not two ends of a chain, but two ways of saying the same thing for what is determinant, but only in the last instance, must also be, or must allow for the effectivity of other relatively autonomous effects in other instances. But, Althusser assures us, this determination, while ever present, is only active, since from the first moment to the last, the lonely hour of the last instance never comes. The problem then, which to a historian might appear to require further empirical investigation and elaboration, appears to Althusser as one which arises from the deficiency of the theory of the specific effectivity of the superstructures. This he sets out to repair, and before the theory of their effectivity or simultaneously, for it is by formulating their effectivity that their essence can be attained, there must be elaboration of the theory of the particular essence of the specific elements of the superstructure. One feels that formulations of this order, which repeatedly attain to the dignity and special clarity of italics, must indeed prepare us for the unveiling of mystery. Nor are we disappointed, for we are introduced to a very great lady, who is not at all to be seen as a slender superstructure sitting on a somewhat large basis, but as a unitary figure. La structure à dominante. She is a totality, but not a spurious Hegelian or Sartrean totality. She is infinitely more definite and rigorous. What determines her existence and structures her dominant personality is, in the last instance, economic. But since the last instance never arrives, it is courteous very often to overlook this material determination. It is impolite to keep on reminding a great lady that she is determined by her tummy. It is more helpful to characterize her by the contradictions in her temperament and to examine these contradictions in their own right, instead of continually harping on the fact that they originate in a bad digestion. Um, this is a very large quote from Althusser. If every contradiction is a contradiction in a complex whole structured in dominance, this complex whole cannot be envisaged without its contradictions, without their basically uneven relations. In other words, each contradiction, each essential articulation of the structure, and the general relation of the articulations in the structure and dominance, constitute so many conditions of the existence of the complex whole itself. This proposition is of the first importance, for it means that the structure of the whole and therefore the difference of the essential contradictions and their structure in dominance is the very existence of the whole, that the difference of the contradictions is identical to the conditions of the existence of the complex whole. In plain terms, this position implies that the secondary contradictions are not the pure phenomena of the principal contradiction, that the principal is not the essence and the secondaries so many of its phenomena, so much so that the principal contradiction might practically exist without the secondary contradictions, or without some of them, or might exist before or after them. On the contrary, it implies that the secondary contradictions are essential even to the existence of the principal contradiction, that they really constitute its condition of existence, just as the principal contradiction constitutes their condition of existence. As an example, take the complex structured whole that is society. Ah, yes, let us take an, or that was the end of the quote, by the way. Ah, yes, let us take an example, even if a trivial one, society. For in plain terms, we had even supposed that Althusser Sir was going a long and windy way around to say that in any complex whole or organism, all attributes must be taken together as one set. And if analysis identifies a principal contradiction, this is A, inherent to its structure, and B, does not thereby disallow subordinate contradictions. But society, it turns out, can be more rapidly dispatched. And this is another quote from Althusser. 
and a long one. In it, the relations of production are not the pure phenomena of the forces of production. They are also their condition of existence. The, super, the superstructure is not the pure phenomenon of the structure. It is also its condition of existence. Please do not misunderstand me. This mutual conditioning of the existence of the contradiction does not nullify the structure in dominance that reigns over the contradictions and in them. In this case, determination in the last instance by the economy. Despite its apparent circle, circularity, this conditioning does not result in the destruction of the structure and domination that constitutes the complexity of the whole and its unity. Quite contrary, even when the even within the reality of the conditions of existence of each contradiction, it is the manifestation of the structure and dominance that unifies the whole. This reflection of the conditions of existence of the contradiction within itself, this reflection of the structure articulated in dominance that constitutes the unity of the complex whole within each contradiction, this is the most profound characteristic of the Marxist dialectic the one I have tried recently to enca encapsulate in the concept of over-determination. It is, that was the end of the quote, or that quote anyway. It is good to know that we have arrived at length at the most profound characteristic of the Marxist dialectic, although we have arrived by Althusser's characteristic idealist method. From ideal premises, we arrive at society as an example. This reorganization of vocabulary has been forced upon Althusser by the deficiencies of economism, which sees the relation between basis and superstructure in an analogy with clockwork mechanism. Uh, here's another Althusser quote. It is economism, mechanism, and not the true Marxist tradition that sets up the hierarchy of instances once and for all, assigns each its essence and role and defines the universal meaning of the relations. It is economism that identifies eternally in advance the determinant contradiction in the last instance with the role of the dominant contradiction, which forever assimilates such and such an aspect, forces of production, economy, practice to the principal role, and such and such another aspect, relations of production, politics, ideology, theory to the secondary role. Whereas in real history, determination in the last instance by the economy is exercised precisely in the per permutations of the principal role between the economy, politics, theory, etc. That's the end of that quote. The concession as to real history is welcome and unusual, although practicing historians can scarcely find the resolution at the end of that sentence to be enlightening. What Althusser appears to be saying is that economism proposed a clockwork analogy, which was both crude and disreputable, and he proposes instead to sophisticate the clockwork. And here's another quote. Unevenness is internal to a social formation because the structuration in dominance of the complex whole, the structural invariant, is itself the precondition for the concrete variation of the contradictions that constitute it, and therefore for their displacements, condensations, and mutations, etc., and inversely because this variation is the existence of that invariant." End quote. Uneven development is not external to contradiction but constitutes its most intimate essence. All this certainly sounds more reputable. We've got rid of Stalin's grandfather clock, which was increasingly coming to look like a rather ugly antique. But we, what we are left with is simply a new styled, more complicated clock with many more moving parts. And these parts are not substantial components derived from historical investigation, monetary systems, constitutions, norms, property rights, but interpolated neologisms. The reorganization has taken place not in substan substantive analysis, theory interacting with inquiry, but in the vocabulary alone. The reason why we are still left with clockwork or philosophical mechanism lies in the theory's character as a structuralism. Very clearly, Althusser's system is more than a flirtation with structuralist terms. 
It does not matter at all whether or not this system qualifies as a structuralism according to certain recent Parisian notations in linguistics, anthropology, or psychoanalysis. What constitutes a structuralism in a more general sense is one, that however many variables are introduced and however complex their permutations, these variables maintain their original fixity as categories. With Smelser, the value system, the factors of production, political arrangements, and the motor structural differentiation. With Althusser, the economy, politics, ideology, and the motor class struggle. Thus, the categories are categories of stasis, even if they are then set in motion as moving parts. Two, movement can only take place within the closed field of the system or structure. That is, however complex and mutually reciprocating the motions of the parts, this movement is enclosed within the overall limits and determinations of the pre-given structure. For both these reasons, history as a process, as open-ended and indeterminate eventuation, but not for that reason devoid of rational logic or of determining pressures, in which categories are defined in particular contexts, but are continuously undergoing historical redefinition, and whose structure is not pre-given, but protean, continually changing in form and in articulation, all this which may be said to constitute far more truly the most profound characteristic of the Marxist dialectic must be denied. And we face here a very difficult problem, and a problem insuperable to those philosophers or sociologists who suppose that formulation is at a higher level than empirical analysis, and that what is requisite is not theoretically informed knowledge, but a theory of history. For it is exceptionally difficult to verbalize as theory history as process. And in particular, no analogies derived from mechanical or organic mechanism and no static structural reconstitution can encompass the logic of indeterminate historical process, a process which remains subject to determinate pressures. In the last analysis, the logic of process can only be described in terms of historical analysis. No analogy derived from any other area can have any more than a limited illustrative metaphoric value, and often, as with basis and superstructure, a static and damaging one. History may only be theorized in terms of its own properties. We may well agree that historical materialism should become more theoretically alert, both as to its procedures and its conclusions, but what requires interrogating and theorizing is historical knowledge. 11. We have by no means finished with the problem of structure and of process, nor with our commentary upon Althusser's propositions, but we may at this point attempt to view this problem in a different perspective, by stepping behind both Althusser and Marx, and situating ourselves in 18th century Naples with Gian Battista Vico. The concept of history as process raises at once the questions of, it, of intelligibility and intention. Each historical event is unique, that many events, widely separated in time and place, reveal, when brought into relation with each other, regularities of process. Vico, confronted with these regularities, struggled to, ref struggled to define process in ways which foresaw simultaneously the anthropological discipline and historical materialism. He said, he proceeds to discuss the natural law of the peoples and show at what certain times and in what determinate ways the customs were born that constitute the entire economy of this law. These are religions, languages, property rights, business transactions, orders, empires, laws, arms, trials, penalties, wars, pieces, and alliances. And from the times and ways in which they were born, he infers the eternal properties which determine that the nature of each that is the time and way of its origin shall be such and not otherwise. Vico was able in a remarkable way to hold in simultaneous suspension without manifest contradiction, a Hegelian, a Marxist, and a structuralist, Levi Straussian variant, heuristic. With Hegel, he described an ideal eternal history traversed in time by the history of every nation uniform ideas originating among entire peoples, 
unknown to each other must have a common ground of truth. From one aspect, this uniformity can be seen as evidence of divine providence. But this providence works its way out through naturalistic means. Our science proceeds by a severe analysis of human thoughts about the human necessities or utilities of social life which are the two perennial springs of the natural law of nations. Human choice, by its nature most uncertain, is made certain and determined by the common sense of men with respect to human needs or utilities. And common sense is ju judgment without reflection, shared by an entire class, an entire people, an entire nation, or the whole human race. Hence, from another aspect, providence may be seen as necessity. Human needs or utilities determining social consciousness in uniform ways. But the uniformity of this judgment without reflection implies also a uniformity of mental structure. The natural law of nations is coval with the customs of the nations, conforming one with another in virtue of a common human sense. And... There must, in the nature of human, be human things, be a mental language common to all nations, which uniformly grasps the substance of things feasible in human social life. So that, from a third aspect, we encounter the notion of a common mental language and common structure of myth. Since this mental language was given to man by divine providence, the circle of argument is closed. Thus, Vico is offering us history as a process with a subject, but this need not necessarily be a historicism. If divine providence is taken as the subject, or as the ultimate directive agent, and humanity as vectors of divine will, then of course we are offered a historicist theology. But since this providence is worked out through natural determinations, then men and women can be seen to be the subjects or agents of their own history. And the ambiguity of Vico's term as usually translated as law, the natural law of nations, derido naturali della gente, has haunted historical materialism from this time forward. If we employ law so as to entail predetermination and prediction, we are open to 700 objections, some 650 of which have been patiently expounded by Sir Karl Popper. It is futile to deny that both Marx and Engels did, on occasion, employ law in this sense, and when they do so, the objections may sometimes be upheld. But of course, law, droit, droit, derido, are words with many infections and ambiguities of meaning. In a set which moves from rule by way of regularity to direction, Historical materialism from the time of Vico has been in search for a term which addresses the uniformities of customs, etc., the regularities of social formations and analyses. These not as laud, or sorry, of social formations, and analyzes these not as laud necessities, nor as fortuitous coincidences, but as shaping and directive pressures, indicative articulations of human practices. I have already suggested that the argument will be advanced if we discard the concept of law and replace it with that of the logic of process. It is Vico's insight into this logic which sustains his position as a precursor of historical materialism. He saw clearly that the historical event is something quite distinct from the sum of individual goals and intentions. He said, it is true that men have themselves made this world of nations, but this world without doubt has issued from a mind often diverse, at times quite contrary, and always superior to the particular ends that men had proposed to themselves. Which narrow ends made means to serve wider ends, it is always employed to preserve the human race upon this earth. Men mean to gratify their bestial lust and abandon their offspring and they inaugurate the chastity of marriage from which the families arise. The fathers mean to exercise without restraint their paternal power and their client over their clients, and they subject them to the civil powers from which the cities arise. The reigning orders of nobles mean to abuse their lordly freedom over the plebeians, and they are obliged to submit to the laws which establish popular liberty. 
The free peoples mean to shake off the yoke of their laws, and they become subject to monarchs. That which did all this was mind, for men did it with intelligence. It was not fate, for they did it by choice, not chance, for the results of their always so acting are perpetually the same. I am directing attention not to Vico's own attempt to attribute to process a cyclical intelligibility, but to his superb expression of process. This is the point from which all sustained historical thought must start. It is to this point that Engels returned in his famous, perhaps one should say notorious, in view of Althusser's heavy-handed treatment of it, letter to Bloch of September 1890. We make our own history, but in the first place under very definite presuppositions and conditions. Among these, the economic ones are finally decisive. How then can we be said to make our own history if the economic movement finally asserts itself as necessary? In proposing a solution, Engels quietly exchanges subjects and replaces we make with history makes itself. History makes itself in such a way that the final result always arises from conflicts between many individual wills, of which each again has been made what it is by a host of particular conditions of life. Thus there are innumerable intersecting forces, an infinite parallelogram of forces which give rise to one resultant, the historical event. This again may itself be viewed as the product of a power which, taken as a whole, works unconsciously and without volition. For what each individual wills is obstructed by everyone else, and what emerges is something that no one willed. Thus, past history proceeds in the manner of a natural process, and is also essentially subject to the same laws of movement. And in his conclusion, Engels attempts to bring the two alternative subjects into relationship. Individual wills, i.e. we, do not attain what they want, but they are merged into a collective mean, a common resultant, and yet each contributes to the resultant and is to this degree involved in it. Althusser has no patience with this whole futile construction, which in some part of his critique he patently misreads. But with other parts of his critique, I find myself in unfamiliar agreement. I would phrase my objections rather differently, but at points we concur. One, Engels has not offered a solution to the problem, but restated it in new terms. He has commenced with the proposition that economic presuppositions are finally decisive, and this is where he concludes. Two, on the way he has gathered in an infinitude of individual wills whose agency in the result is cancelled out, something that no one willed. 3. The model of an infinite parallelogram of forces derived from physics obscures what it should clarify. 4. In adopting this model, Engels has unconsciously fallen back upon the presuppositions of classical bourgeois ideology and bourgeois political economy. Adam Smith's Sum of Self-Interest, Rousseau's General Will, but the historical resultant cannot usefully be conceived as the involuntary product of the sum of an infinity of mutually contradictory individual volitions, since these individual wills are not destructured atoms in collision, but act with, upon, and against each other as grouped wills, as families, communities, interests, and above all, as classes. In this sense, Vico, who proposes not individual wills, but fathers, clients, nobles, plebeians, free peoples, monarchs, has stated the problem of process better than Engels. And if Engels, in this hurried letter, had remembered his own thinking and writing on all this, then he would have offered not a restatement of the problem, but some indication of a resolution. For these individual wills, however particular their conditions of life, have been conditioned in class ways, and if the historical resultant is then seen as the outcome of a collision of contradictory class interests and forces, then we may see how human agency gives rise to an involuntary result. The, the economic movement finally asserts itself as necessary, and how we may say at one and the same time that we make our own history, and history makes itself. 
I have in these last sentences departed a very long way from Althusser. We shall see how far in a moment. One or two of our local criticisms of the text are concurrent, but Althusser sees the whole construction as futile because Engels has proposed a non-problem. If the economic movement produces the historical result, then we should get on with the analysis of structures and, and dismiss individual wills. The very notion of human agency is no more than the semblance of a problem for bourgeois ideology. I, on the contrary, consider that Engels has proposed a very critical problem, agency and process, and that despite deficiencies, the general tendency of his meditation is helpful. At least he does not discount the crucial ambivalence of our human presence in our own history, part subjects, part objects, the voluntary agents of our own involuntary determinations. Four years before Engels wrote to Bloch, an English communist had reflected upon the same problem in his own very different idiom. I pondered all these things and how men fight and lose the battle and the thing that they fought for comes about in spite of their defeat. And when it comes, turns out not to be what they meant and other men have to fight for what they meant under another name. For William Morris, the accent falls even more sharply upon agency. But men are seen as the ever baffled and ever resurgent agents of an unmastered, unmastered history. Since process ensued in regularities which did not conform to the actor's intentions, Vico saw history as issuing from a mind, always superior to the particular ends that men have proposed to themselves. Engels was, was reduced to a metaphor which introduced analogies from positivist law. The theoretical event, oh, I lost, I lost myself. The historical event may itself be viewed as the product of a power which works unconsciously, a reminder of Vico's divine providence. But also history makes itself and proceeds in the manner of a natural process, a reminder of Vico's necessity of human needs or utilities. It is manifest that when we say that history is not only process, but process with intelligible regularities and forms, the mind finds it difficult to resist the conclusion that history must therefore be programmed in some way, whether the programming be divine or natural. And again and again, we notice the attribution of extra historical or teleological sequences and goals, goals to which process is seen to move towards. Issuing from a mind, the product of a power, the realization of a potentia imminent within the essence or at the origin of the process, which manifests itself in the development of forms. This attribution can certainly be resisted and it is not entailed in the premises of process and of social formations, but neither Vico nor Engels succeeded always in resisting it, nor did Marx in his grund space nor, very certainly, does Althusser, despite his repeated polemics against historicism. Althusser's preferred solution is in two parts. First, he evicts human agency from history, which then becomes a process without a subject. Human events are the process, but human... Human events are the process, but human practice, and still less intentions, wills, contributes nothing to this process. So far from being original, this is a very ancient mode of thought. Process is fate. Ugh. I've got like fur in my eyeball. But if a human process without a human subject appears nevertheless to be not wholly fortuitous, a mere outcome of random collisions, but to be shaped and patterned in ways intelligible to humans, then by an equally ancient mode of thought, it must be seen as being willed, being subject to some extra human compulsion. Providence, the divine will, the idea, evolutionary destiny, necessity. Althusser wishes to expel such teleologies, historicism. So in his second part, he evicts process from history. Rather like a medieval emblem of death, he leans over history's deathbed, operates on the prone body, and liberates its soul. After this surgical parturition, 
under the knife of theoretical practice, history reappears in two forms. Form one, an infinity, a bad infinity of human events and collisions of human wills, which, however, since they are formless, are not historical. Events turn out to be non-events. For what makes such and such an event historical is not the fact that it is an event, but precisely its insertion into forms which are themselves historical. Whatever cannot be inserted into these forms are unhappenings. Historically, and very much of the inert body of history, turns out to be composed of such. Form one can now be dismissed, and hurriedly, for the body is corrupting even before it is interred. Form two of history is its soul, but what can this soul be if it is not events, unless it be those forms which guarantee that an event is truly historical? A historical fact is a fact which causes a mutation in the existing structural relations. Process turns out to be not historical process at all. This wretched soul has been incarnated in the wrong body. But the structural articulation of social and economic formations, as Smelser and others had long supposed, Form two, the soul must therefore quickly be reincarnated in a more theoretically hygienic body. The soul of process must be arrested in its flight and thrust into the marble statue of structural immobilism. And there she sits, the gracious lady whom we have already met, la structure à dominante. This is not one of Althusser's more elegant passages of argument. At a first common sense reading, it might pass. After all, if I get up from my desk, as I will do shortly, to take the darned dog for a walk, this is scarcely an historical event. So that what makes events historical must be defined in some other way. But historical events remain events, even after we have made a theoretical s s selection. Oh, fuck. Theory does not reduce events to structures. Even when we have defined out innumerable events as of negligible interest to historical analysis, what we must analyze remains as a process of eventuation. Indeed, it is exactly the significance of the event to this process which affords the criterion for selection. Nor is there any guarantee against teleology, as Althusser appears to suppose, in reducing process to stasis. It was the old error of mechanical materialism, and also of analogies from natural process brought to bear upon human affairs, to suppose that a clock is a clock is a clock. But on closer inspection, ideological clockmakers have been identified and goals have been found, not only at the terminus of process, but planted in the automatic motions of clocks. For if a mode of production is proposed to entail a regular and rational form of, sequ of sequential development and a complex but uniform internal relational structuration, independent of the rationality and agency of the human actors who in fact produce and relate, then very soon the questions will be asked, whose is the divine will which programmed this automating structure? Where is the, where is the ulter ulterior unconscious power. Perhaps Althusser was aware of the tawdry texture of this argument in For Marx, for in subsequent writings he has returned with increasing obsessiveness to these two evictions from history, the eviction of human agency, the eviction of historical time or process. I have presented these two propositions in sequence, but in fact they arise in his theory simultaneously. We will consider first his elevated disquisition on historical time and reading capital. This is difficult for a historian to handle with patience. It is composed in about equal parts of banalities, of elaborate verbalizations, which offer no purchase whatsoever for actual historical analysis, and of ridiculous errors. The banalities are composed of polemics against antagonists of straw and pompous observations directed toward historians. To draw their attention to empiricist ideology, which, with a few exceptions, overwhelmingly dominates every variety of history. Um, 
as to matters which have been the object of advanced historical investigation for decades. The best that we can say of these observations is that they served the purpose of revealing Althusser's ignorance of historiography in his own country, as Mark Bloch's comparative methods, Bordell's reflections on historical time. The kindest thing that can be said is that one or two of the problems which he gestures towards have been formulated long before in historical practice. How else could British and French historians exchange views on the bourgeois revolution? British and Indian historians bring into a common discourse medieval societies governed by plantagenets and moguls. American and Japanese historians exchange knowledge on the differential developments of industrial revolutions without, that, without this being so. The worst that can be said is that, once again, Althusser announces as original and rigorous Marxist theory notions disintegrative of the full historical process, notions highly regarded within bourgeois historiography, notably in the United States, as in certain forms of comparative history, development theory, and modernization theory. Theories supported by an elaborated armory of positivistic methodology. As so often before, Althusser has been arrested by bourgeois concepts and taken for a bourgeois ride. He seeks not to transform these concepts, but to convert their vocabulary. The verbalizations and the errors we can take together. Uh, here's a quote from Althusser. We must grasp in all its rigor the absolute necessity of liberating the theory of history from any compromise with empirical temporality with the ideological concept of time which underlies and overlies it, or with the ideological idea that the theory of history as theory could be subject to the concrete determinations of historical time. In what does this liberation consist? It consists precisely in displacing process by structure. More strictly, structures, modes of production, social formations, do not eventuate and undergo transformations within the larger historical process. Structure, like a whale, opens its jaws and swallows process up. Thereafter, process survives unhappily in structure's stomach. To do this trick of theoretical practice, it is necessary to redefine synchrony and diachrony. Structure cannot be disclosed by synchronic procedures in their customary sense. For example, by freezing history into, mo into a momentary pose taking a section at a moment of stasis, analyzing the articulation of a totality. For swallowed process is inscribed within structure and survives as the development of that structure's forms. Not only does structure have a developmental progression, vestigial process, but it is articulated with great complexity and characterized by uneven development. Althusser quote, I have shown that in order to conceive this dominance of a structure over the other structures, in the unity of a conjuncture, it is necessary to refer to the principle of the determinations in the last instance of the non-economic structures by the economic structure, and that this determination in the last instance is an absolute precondition for the necessity and intelligibility of the displacements of structures in the hierarchy of affectivity or of the displacement of dominance between the structured levels of the whole." End quote. But at any particular conjuncture, when we might choose to arrest history or take a section, the last instance, which we remember never arrives, is not likely to be around. This kind of synchrony, which looks for a simultaneous instant of totality, will misread the evidence. Moreover, most of the other instances or levels of the structure will present themselves improperly, since they are all motoring around on different schedules. Very long Althusser quote, quote, starting now. We can argue from the specific structure of the Marxist whole that it is no longer possible to think the process of the development of the different levels of the whole in the same historical time. Each of these different levels does not have the same type of historical existence. On the contrary, we have to assign to each level a peculiar time, relatively autonomous and hence relatively independent. Even in its dependence of the times of the other levels, 
we can and must say, for each mode of production there is a peculiar time in history, punctuated in a specific way by the development of the productive forces. The relations of production have their peculiar time in history punctuated in a specific way. The political superstructure has its own history, philosophy has its own time in history, aesthetic production, scientific formations, etc., etc. Each of these peculiar histories is punctuated with peculiar rhythms and can only be known on condition that we have defined the concept of the specificity of its historical, temporarily, and its punctuations, continuous development, revolutions, breaks, etc. The fact that each of these times and each of these histories is relatively autonomous does not make them so many domains which are independent of the whole. The specificity of each of these times and each of these histories, in other words, their relative autonomy and independence, is based on a certain type of articulation in the whole, and therefore on a certain type of dependence with respect to the whole. And so we drone on, as we, as we may, may well do. Obviously, that marked the end of the quote. And so we drone on, as we may well do, for the possible permutations of structure, levels, instances, last instances, relative autonomy, specificity, peculiar, and articulation are inexhaustible. The mode and degree of independence of each time in history is therefore necessarily determined by the mode and degree of dependence of each level within the set of articulations of the whole. The point is that the customary ideological notion of synchrony is likely to overlook all this, nor can we even take a ragged, temporarily slantwise section of the structure, since while this might give us an indication of the hierarchy of levels, and in fact Althusser is always giving us vaporous verbal sections of this kind, it will not show us the operative principles of dominance and development. We must be enabled to think in its peculiar articulation the function of such an element or such a level in the current configuration of the whole. The task is, enter quote by Althusser, to determine the relation of articulation of this element as a function of other elements, of this structure as a function of other structures. It obliges us to define what has been called its overdetermination or underdetermination as a function of the structure of the determination of the whole. It obliges us to define what might be called, in another language, the index of determination, the index of effectivity currently attributable to the element or structure in question and the general structure of the whole. By index of effectivity, we may understand the character or of more or less dominant or subordinate and therefore more or less paradoxical determination of a given element or structure in the current mechanism of the whole. And this is nothing but the theory of the conjuncture indispensable to the theory of history. I do not want to go any further with this analysis, although it has still hardly been elaborated at all." End quote. This is wise because the theory of the conjuncture, which is indispensable, but which is nowhere elaborated, would not appear to be a theory at all, but an exalted way of saying now. But now, whether today is now or some moment of now in the past, may also be seen as synchronic knowledge. The synchronic is then nothing but the conception of the specific relations that exist between the different elements and the different structures of the structure of the whole. Um, this is a quote by Althusser, if you didn't notice. It is the knowledge of the relations of dependence and articulation which makes it an organic whole a system. The synchronic is eternity in Spinoza's sense, or the adequate knowledge of a complex object by the adequate knowledge of its complexity. This is exactly what Marx is distinguishing from the concrete real historical sequence in the words. How indeed could the single logical formula of movement, a sequence of time, explain the body of society in which all economic relations coexist simultaneously and support one another? End quote. The synchronic, then, is this new usage, is a concept of immense dignity. It is nothing less than the theory of Spinozan eternity, the knowledge of the exceedingly complex character of la structure à dominante. <laughs> awesome. 
But there is still a small place left for the diachronic, which we remember was swallowed by structures some time ago, but still has an impoverished existence within structure's stomach. Historical time is an ideological concept derived by empiricism from the supposed obviousness of the concrete real historical sequence. Under theoretical scrutiny, diachrony reveals itself to be merely the false name for the process or for what Marx called the development of forms. But this process is no longer the whole process of historical eventuation within which structures and social formations arise and are transformed. This process is now an attribute of structure or more exactly, it is the history of structures, possible permutations, combinations and forms this concept of historical time. Um, this concept of historical time, enter Althusser quote, can only be based on the complex and differentially articulated structure in dominance of the social totality that constitutes the social formation arising from a determinate mode of production. It can only be assigned a content as a function of the structure of that totality considered either as a whole or in its different levels. In particular, it is only possible to give a, co a content to the concept of historical time by defining historical time as the specific form of existence of the social totality under consideration, an existence in which different structural levels of temporarily, of temporar temporarily interfere because of the peculiar relations of correspondence. Mm, that didn't make sense. Non-correspondence, articulation, dislocation, and torsion, which obtain between the different levels of the whole in accordance with its general structure. End quote. Thus, the eviction of process from history and its subsequent incorporation as a secondary attribute of structure. In all this exposition, I have more than allowed to Althusser his say, and I think that I have even improved upon his argument by marking sequential propositions more firmly and by compressing some of his repetitious rhetorical invocations. We will now offer some observations. And first, it can be seen that this is very much more than a flirtation with the vocabulary of structuralism. This is an inexorable structuralism, even though it is, in this or that respect, a different one from those derived from Saussure, Levi Strauss, or Lacan. It shares fully in that ideological predisposition of that moment conjuncture of the Cold War stasis, which Sartre has identified, a dominant tendency toward the denial of history. In this moment, structuralism gives the people what they needed. An eclectic synthesis in which Rob Grier, structuralism, linguistics, Lacan, and Telkel are systematically utilized to demonstrate the impossibility of historical reflection. Behind history, of course, it is Marxism which is attacked. Second, we should note the apparent reputability of the rhetorical acrobatics. If we suppose, as Althusser always does appear to suppose, that the only possible alternative to his version of Marxism is the most crude caricature of vulgar economism, then any aspirant intellectual subject or intellectual subjected to the cynical scrutiny of bourgeois scholars will clearly opt for Althusser. If we must say either with Stalin that the base creates the superstructure precisely in order that it may serve it, or with Althusser that between the different levels of the whole there are peculiar relations of correspondence, non-correspondence, articulation, dislocation, and torsion, then if we are in a seminar at the Sorbonne we will find the latter vocabulary more reputable. We may also find that the assignment of different times and histories to different relatively autonomous levels political, aesthetic, scientific, philosophic, etc., affords to us a Marxist legitimation for carrying on with age-old academic procedures of isolation, which are objectively disintegrative of the inter enterprise of historical materialism, the understanding of the full historical process. Thus, Althusser can only pose as a flexible theorist by suppressing any recognition of the actual practice, theory, and findings of historians in the Marxist tradition and in other traditions as well. Third, we may note, once again, the characteristically idealist mode of discourse. Althusser supposes that we can attain to a theory of structure, of history, 
by rearranging and elaborating our vocabulary. Now, clearly, any statement, however abstract, however empirical, is constituted of an arrangement of words, and certain crucially significant conceptual discoveries may at first be formulated in a highly abstract manner. One ought to welcome the informed scrutiny by philosophers of the lax employment by histo historians of unexamined concepts, but it is difficult to understand how a theory of history can be elaborated which does not at any point submit itself to the historical discipline, to historians' own court discourse of the proof. And this, as I have sufficiently argued, involves the empirical interrogation of evidence, the dialogue of hypothesis, in fact. Well, then it may be argued that Althusser, in his generosity, has presented to historians not one concept, but several volumes of con concepts and hypotheses, which should now be tested in historical laboratories. But this will never be possible unless in such factories as that of Messer, Hindus, and Hurst, who have discovered the secret of manufacturing synthetic history and synthetic sociology out of conceptual error. For Althusser's categories have already been desocialized and dehistoricized before we can start. They commence their life as categories of stasis, that is, however elaborate the orbits in which they rotate, the permutations between orbits, and the distortions as they are presented to the differential, differential fields of gravity of other orbiting categories and the great attractive power of la dominante. However much fussy complexity of motion is simulated by the vocabulary, the categories remain distinct, isolated from each other, the same. Moreover, we are offered an arbitrary selection of categories as economics, politics, ideology, and neither the principle of selection nor the categories themselves are examined. In the crucially important passages which we set out at length above, we hear nothing about the state and almost nothing about classes. Other categories are absent throughout. We hear nothing about power. Perhaps this is politics, although in real history it may often also be economics or law or religion. We hear nothing about consciousness, whether as mentalite or as culture or habitus or as class consciousness and nothing about values or value systems, unless in their dismissal along with moralism and ideology. Thus we are given an arbitrary, theoretically unjustified selection of categories, and these are static, unexamined ones, which supposedly maintain their analytic effectivity, not only through all the development of forms of a given mode of production, but also in differing modes of production, for feudalism also has politics, economics, religion, etc. But over historical time, the real content of these categories has changed so profoundly as to impose upon the historian extreme care in their employment. Just as over the same period, science has changed from magic to alchemy, uh, to science, to technology, and sometimes to ideology. The reason why Althusser is able to employ static categories in this way is that they are empty of all social and historical content. All that has been tipped away, and his rotating instances are like so many hollow tin cans. If we scarcely hear about the state or about class, we cannot expect to hear about particular state formations, or about which classes, or about alternative and conflicting beliefs within ideology. The talismanic concepts are relative autonomy, and in the last instance, determination. We were given these by angles, and we learned them in our theoretical cradle. Althusser now polishes them, gives them back to us, and supposes that they illuminate the whole historical landscape. But determination, which is at the still center of his whole revolving gravitational field, does not merit one sentence of theoretical scrutiny. In the last instance, is not examined. It is merely perpetually postponed. Relative autonomy, on the contrary, has been lovingly um, elaborated over many pages and reappears as instances, levels, differential temporalities, dislocations, and torsions. Yes, yes, and perhaps all this is so. But how, one, how might we put such a concept to work? Is law, for example, relatively autonomous? And if so, autonomous of what and how relatively? I have, as it happens, been interested in this myself in my historical practice, not, of course, in any grand way for the whole of history, nor for the 
for the capitalist mode of production everywhere, but in a very petty conjuncture, in an island on the edge of the Atlantic, very well supplied with lawyers at a moment in the 18th century. So my evidence is highly marginal, as well as being seriously contaminated by empirical content. But what I discovered there would make la, st la structure a dominante boggle, for I found that law did not keep politely to a level, but was at every bloody level. It was imbricated within the mode of production and productive relations themselves as property rights, definitions of agrarian practice, and it was simultaneously present in the philosophy of Locke. It intruded brusquely within alien categories, reappearing bewigged and gowned in the guise of ideology. It danced a cotillon with religion, moralizing over the theater of Tiburn. It was an arm of politics and politics was one of its arms. It was an academic discipline subjected to the rigor of its own autonomous logic. It contributed to the definition of the self-identity both of rulers and of ruled. Above all, it afforded an arena for class struggle within which alternative notions of law were fought out. But how about in the last instance determination? Did I observe that? Well, for most of the time when I was watching, law was running quite free of economy, doing its errands, defending its property, preparing the way for it, and so on. But, I hesitate to whisper the heresy, on several occasions while I was actually watching, the lonely hour of the last instance actually came. The last instance, like an unholy ghost, actually grabbed hold of law, throttled it, and forced it to change its language, and to will into existence forms appropriate to the mode of production, such as enclosure, acts, and new case law excluding customary common rights. But was law relatively autonomous? Oh yes, sometimes relatively, of course. Please do not misunderstand me. I am not only arguing that Althusser has taken his categories unexamined from his own academic surroundings, the departments of politics, law, economics, etc., academic isolates, which any historian in his apprenticeship learns to disregard. Nor am I only arguing that Althusser's elaborate constructions advance inquiry not one jot that we commence with relative autonomy and after tedious exercises in sophistication, but without putting the concept to any real work or feeding it with any content, we come out at the end with exactly relative autonomy, a kind of oratorical sauce with which to season our researches, but for which, since my palate has always approved it, we have to thank not Althusser, but Engels. Nor am I only arguing that Althusser's concepts and constructions are futile, because they are merely arrangements of words, so lacking in substantive content that they afford no purchase to a historian as analytic tools. All these things are true, but I am also arguing that Althusser's constructions are actively wrong and thoroughly misleading. His notion of levels motoring around in history at different speeds and on different schedules is an academic fiction. For all these instances and levels are in fact human activities, institutions, and ideas. We are talking about men and women in their material life, in their determinate relationships, in their experience of these, and in their self-consciousness of this experience. By determinate relationships, we indicate relationships structured within particular social formations in class ways, a very different set of levels, and one generally overlooked by Althusser and that the class experience will find simultaneous expression in all these instances, levels, institutions, and activities. It is true that the effectivity of class experience in conflict will be differently expressed in different activities and institutions, and that we may, by an act of analytic isolation, write distinct histories of these. But at least some part of what is expressed as fear of the crowd in politics reappearing as contempt for manual labor among the genteel reappearing as contempt for praxis in the academy reappearing as black acts in the law reappearing as doctrines of subordination in religion will be the same unitary experience or determining pressure eventuating in the same historical time and moving to the same rhythm 
A peasant revolt or the Gordon riots may accentuate the pressure. A long zude of good harvests and demographic equilibrium may allow it to relax so that all these distinct histories must be convened within the same real historical time, the time within which process eventuates. This integral process is the ultimate object of historical knowledge, and it is this which Althusser offers to disintegrate. Certainly, relative autonomy is a helpful talisman against reductionism, against collapsing art or law or religion abjectly back into class or economics. But without substantial addition and substantive analysis, it remains as nothing more than a warning notice. Certainly the hour of the last instance never comes, if by that hour one supposes the total collapse of all human activities back into the elementary terms of a mode of production. Such collapses may be detonated on paper, they often are, but they cannot be observed in history. But, in another sense, the last instance has always arrived, and is ever-present as a pressure within all of Althusser's instances. Nor is the last instance ever lonely, for it is attended by all the retinue of class." That was a long observation. Althusser's mode of discourse is idealist. He employs static categories derived from the disciplines of the academy. La structure à dominante is too well bred to acknowledge class in her character, and his constructions are disintegrative of process. The fourth observation may be brief. Althusser's constructions of the theory of history afford no terms for experience, nor for process when it is considered as human practice. We have already discussed long ago Althusser's epistemological refusals of experience, empiricism, that was odd, but a pardon pardonable oddity in a philosopher who can cite formidable precedents. But it is not pardonable in anyone who offers to think about history, since experience and practice are manifest. Nor is it pardonable in a Marxist, since experience is a necessary middle term between social being and social consciousness. It is experience, often class experience, which gives a coloration to culture, to values, and to thought. It is by means of experience the mode of production exerts a determining pressure upon other activities, and it is by practice that production is sustained. The reason for these omissions will become clear when we consider the other eviction, the eviction of human agency. My fifth observation has been argued sufficiently in passing. Althusser's structuralism is, like all structuralisms, a system of closure. It fails to affect the distinction between structured process which, while subject to determinate pressures, remains open-ended and only partially determined, and a structured whole within which process is encapsulated. It opts for the latter and goes on to construct something much more splendid than a clock. We may call it Althusser's orary. A complex mechanism in which all the bodies in the solar system revolve around the dominant sun, but it remains a mechanism in which as in all such structuralisms, human practice is reified, and man is in some way developed by the development of structure. So inexorable is this mechanism in the relation of parts to the whole within any mode of production, that it is only by, hum by means of the most acrobatic formulations that we can envisage the possibility of transition from one mode of production to another. In all the passages of argument cited above, there is only one argument which I find to be good. This is, the, this, is in, uh, this is in Althusser's critique of the synchronic method of our structuralisms, or sociological theories, which by arresting process and taking a section, suppose that the articulation of a totality will be revealed, but the critique is inadequate and for good reasons for an adequate critique would have exploded in Althusser's own face. It is not only that the structuration of process, or as I would prefer the congruent logics of process, can only be revealed in the observation of process over time. It is also that each moment, each now conjuncture, should not be seen as a fro frozen moment of the intersection of multiple subordinate and dominant determinations over determination but as a moment of becomings, of alternative possibilities, of ascendant and descendant forces, 
of opposing class definitions and exertions of double-tongued signs. Between these two notions of the now, there lies an unbridgeable gulf which falls between necessity, or Vico's divine will, and Morris's over-baffled but ever-resurgent human agents. On the one hand, history is a process without a subject. On the other, history as unmastered human practice. We know which side Althusser is on, process programmed within a structure, an orary turned by a hidden hand. Twelve. And yet, we had almost forgotten, a motive power is provided. For class struggle is the motor of history. We first meet with this basic Marxist proposition in For Marx. We have found the hidden hand. We hear about this less in reading Capital, the class struggle, scarcely appears in any of its critical formulations on history, and this may account for my forgetfulness. But it reappears, and with the sternest political countenance, in the wigging which Althusser gave to the good Dr. Lewis, it is now a thesis of Marxism-Leninism. The class struggle is the motor of history. Now there are certain points to make about this basic Marxist proposition, unexceptional, unexceptionable as it may be. First, and a trivial point, I can find the proposition nowhere in Marx, nor can my more learned friends. It is certainly not to be found in the Communist Manifesto, although the reader might suppose, I did suppose, that we were being offered a direct quotation. What the manifesto does say in its opening line, as should be too well known to repeat, is the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles, to which Engels subsequently added a footnote excusing from the formulation primitive societies, which we must presume had no motor. The two statements in any case are not the same, but I do find on occasion in Marx and Engels analogies which bring us very close to motor. For example, in a letter of 1879 to the German party leaders, Bebel, etc., over the signatures of both, they write, For almost 40 years we have stressed the class struggle as the immediate driving power of history, and in particular the class struggle between bourgeoisie and proletariat as the great lever of the modern social revolution. So the point turns not to be a quibble, or the point turns out to be a quibble. Althusser may keep his motor and we may offer him a lover as well. There was another point which I cannot now remember. Oh yes, motor is not a basic proposition or a concept or a thesis at all. It is an analogy. This point is a little more difficult. If Marx had said, and I think he did not, that the class struggle is the motor of history, he would not have meant that the class struggle had somehow trans transmogrified itself into a Bolton and Watt steam engine, driving history's moving parts. The statement is of the order of as if we may envisage the history of society as if it were driven forward by the power engine motor of the class struggle. Analogies may be good or bad, but my present point is that they serve the purpose of explication or illustration. They are a condiment to argument often used only once or twice in passing, but they are not the argument them, uh, they are not the argument itself. They may sometimes be greatly illuminating and in ways unintended by the author. They merit a symptomatic reading. In certain authors, for example Burke, they may be more illuminating than the argument itself. They are often the sign of thought's vitality. But, and still, analogies, metaphors, images are not the same thing as concepts. They cannot be transfixed with the arrow of theory, plucked from the side of the text which they explicate, and mounted as concepts on a plinth inscribed basic proposition. It may not matter much in this case, but it does matter very much in the case of another analogy, which has more generally been petrified into a concept that of basis and superstructure. The graveyard of philosophy is cluttered with grand systems which mistook analogies for concepts. 
headstone is already being prepared for Marxist structuralism. Point three, is it a good analogy? Not particularly. The reader who has bothered to accompany me this far can certainly think this out for himself. I have argued before that there are definite reasons why analogies derived from mechanism or from natural process can never be adequate to human process, which includes properties not to be found in either. Given that the attempt must sometimes be made for purposes of explication, the analogy of driving power is inoffensive. Driving power is not, of course, the same thing as the engine or motor itself, which initiates the drive. Marx and Engels, who lived in the prehistory of the internal combustion engine, were perhaps thinking of a Lancashire cotton mill, and not of the engine and its furnace, but of the shafts and transmission belts which directed the same drive to different machines and moving parts. This drive, transmitted equally to law and politics and ideology, becomes, by analogy, the class struggle, and all the parts in motion together, the factory, become history. The analogy may be helpful in some ways, and unhelpful in others, but what concerns us is the use to which it is put by Althusser. For we remember that for Althusser, history, in its common usage as eventuating human, human process, is an ideological concept to be rejected along with historical time. But Althusser also must recognize that Marx himself was not innocent of this ideological error. Indeed, how could he not recognize this when Marx and Engels' works are full of allusions and invocations to history as process? Marx offers us a structuralism, a premonition of Althusserianism, but he was insufficiently aware, theoretically, of what he was offering and of the difference between this and historicism. He did not think the concept of this distinction with all the sharpness that could be desired he did not think theoretically either, or he did not think theoretically either the concept or the theoretical implications of the theoretically re revolutionary step he had taken. Following Vico, Marx blundered into a remarkable presupposition that the actors of history are the authors of its text, the subjects of its production. One might note in passing that this is not one presupposition, presupposition but two different analogies. Actors certainly are not usually authors of their text, but they are subjects of a theatrical production, although in ways partially determined by the producer. In Marx's discourse, there are lacunae, blanks, and failures of rigor, and these occur when we encounter the word history, an apparently full word, but in fact theoretically an empty word, replete with ideology. However, in Althusser's epistemological and critical reading, we cannot be he but hear behind the preferred word, the silence it conceals. See the blank of suspended rigor, scarcely the time of a lightning flash in the darkness of the text. It is the business of theoretical practice, like a skilled restorer of old manuscripts, to mend these tears, repair these blanks and silences, and restore the text. It must follow that if both Marx and Althusser say that class struggle is the motor of history, which Marx does not, they are saying different things, for Marx is thinking absent-mindedly of an ideological process of struggle and eventuation, and Althusser has rigorously thought a structural orrery. History is an immense natural human system in movement, and the motor of history is class struggle. History is a process and a process without a subject. For Marx, the historical process eventuates as if it was impelled forward by this generalized drive of conflicting actors. For Althusser, the orary of system literally is motored through all its evolutions and permutations by class struggle. We are not for a moment allowed to suppose that classes are the subjects of history, which might then be seen as the outcome of refracted human agency. Althusser does, in a concession to a supposedly simple-minded English public, once offer the thesis. It is the masses which make history. No one, it seems, had warned him in this empirical island the category of masses had long been scrutinized and found to be a disreputable, indeed a bourgeois concept. But the concession is no sooner made than it is withdrawn, 
for the masses are made to make history. They are motored by the class struggle and the classes also, it turns out, are motored. Class is a category which in Althusser's major work goes unexamined and the classes which do make an entrance from time to time and march up and down the pages, the bourgeoisie, the proletariat, are exceedingly crude projections of theory like primeval urges with iron heads, since politics, law, etc., etc., have been taken out of their heads and put at different levels, and since consciousness, values, and culture have been excluded from, from the vocabulary. So that while we are told that class struggle is the motor of history, there's a theoretical cutoff beyond which we, mu we may not go. We are not informed as to the nature of classes, nor how struggle eventuates, nor how this motor works. Althusser's contribution to reading Capital concludes, the reader will know how volume three ends. A title, classes, 40 lines, then silence, then silence. After Althusser, his Epigenes, Balabar, Hindus, and Hurst, Polansis, and a hundred others, have been happily filling in that silence, taking advantage of the blank pages in Marx's unfinished notebook. I do not like what they write, for historical materialism has also made, over many decades, its own very substantial investigations into class struggle, and has developed its findings in theoretical ways. There are disagreements among practitioners, of course, but in this area, and within the British tradition of Marx's historiography, there is very substantial agreement, and our findings cannot, with any exercise of verbal agility, be compressed into the forms of Althusser's orary. I have written about this so often that I bore not only my audience, but myself. I will not go over it all again. Class formations, I have argued, arise at the intersection of determination and self-activity. The working class made itself as much as it was made. We cannot put class here and class consciousness there as two separate entities, the one sequential upon the other, since both must be taken together. The experience of determination and the handling of this in conscious ways. Nor can we deduce class from a static section, since it is a becoming over time, nor as a function of a mode of production, since class formations and class consciousness, while subject to determinate pressures, eventuate an open-ended process of relationship, of struggle with other classes over time. As it happens, Althusser and I appear to share one common proposition. Class struggle is the prior concept to class. Class does not proceed, but arises out of struggle. But the coincidence is only an apparition. For in one view, a view shared by most Marxist historians, uh, classes arise because men and women in determinate productive relations identify their antagonistic interests and it come to struggle, to think, and to value in class ways. Thus the process of class formation is a process of self-making, although under conditions which are given. But this view is intolerable to Althusser, since it would give back to process a subject, for the process would then be seen to be one in which men and women however baffled and however limited their space for agency, remain agents. Althusser, however, while silent on class, has never taken one step along the dangerous humanist road. For prior to the concept of, of the class struggle is the concept of contradiction, and the second concept is a function of the first. Here's a quote from Althusser. The specific difference of Marx's contradiction is its unevenness or overdetermination, which reflects in, its, in it its condition of existence. That is, the specific structure of unevenness in dominance of the ever pre-given complex whole, which is its, its existence. Thus understood, contradiction is the motor of all development. End quote. The whole of this monstrous theoretical expression, and several lines more, are italicized to emphasize their centrality and their rigor, but I have spared the reader's eyes. I cannot so easily spare his thoughts, for we now find that contradiction is the motor which motors the motor of class struggle. Tracing these motors back in series, Balabar concludes with estimable logic. 
classes are functions of the process of production as a whole. They are not its subjects. On the contrary, they are determined by its form. The subject or agent of history disappears once again. Process for the rough time is reified. And since classes are functions of the process of production, a process into which it seems no human agency could possibly enter, the way is thrown open once again to all the rubbish of deducing classes, class fractions, class ideologies, true and false, from their imaginary positioning, above, below, interpolatory, vestigial, slantwise, within a mode of production, or within its multiple contradictions, torsions, dislocations, etc., etc., and this mode of production is conceived of as something other than its eventuation in, his, in a historical process and within the ensemble of social relations, although in fact it exists only as a construction within a metaphysical oration. We might define the present situation more precisely if we employed a category found frequently in Marx's correspondence with Engels, but a category which evaded Althusser's vigilant symptomatic scrutiny all this shit in which both bourgeois sociology and Marxist structuralism stand up to their chins, um, Derendorf beside Polancis, modernization theory beside theoretical practice, has been shat upon as by conceptual paralysis, by the dehistoricizing of process, and by reducing class, ideology, social formations, and also everything else to categorical stasis. The sociological section, the elaborate differential rotations within the closure of the orary, the self-extrapolating programmed developmental series, the mildly disequilibriated <laughs> equilibrium models in which dissensus strays unhappily down strange corridors, searching for a reconciliation with consensus. The systems analyses and structuralisms with their torques and their com combinatories, the counterfactual fictions, the econ econometric and cleometric groovers, all of these theories hobble along programmed routes from one static category to the next, and all of them are, oh fuck, geshish den flop. I clearly cannot pronounce this word. It is extremely lengthy and tremendously German. Unhistorical shit. That was the end of the sentence. And yet, in these days, we are offered little else. They torture us on the rack of their interminable formulations until we are brought to the limits of endurance. We may not answer in any other language, only this one is rigorous and reputable. Above our heads in the high academies, the inquisitors dispute. They fiercely disagree, but they recognize each other's complexity and repute. At last, they extract from us a denial, a denial of human agency, creativity, a denial even of self. But as we rise from their theoretical racks, we see through the window the process of history going on. E per si move. And yet it does move. We know for in some remote part of our personality, we remain determined by reason that we must somehow find the courage to repudiate our own denial. As our senses return, we remember why we never did much like the analogy of class struggle as the motor of history. For it supposes two distinct entities, history, which is inert, an intricate composite of parts and a motor class struggle which is brought to it and which drives these parts or sets them in motion. Medieval scholastics would have used a different analogy. Class struggle would have been the vital breath or soul that animated history's inert body. But class struggle is the process or some part of it and struggling classes are the body or some part of it. Seen from this aspect, history is its own motor. This leads us to a general reflection upon the language of structuralism. Once again, we can observe the pressure of social being upon social consciousness, not only within bourgeois ideology, but within Marxist thought as well. 
I have sketched already the political and sociological context, the glaciation of all social process induced by the Cold War. But there have been other intersecting reasons. European thinkers in the 19th century were disposed to grasp at analogies from natural process, often progress, not only for manifest political and sociological reasons, but because this language seemed to be given by the technology and the natural sciences of their time. Today's theorists are very differently situated. In the first place, they are segregated more than ever before by, or more than ever before from practice. They work within institutions which are complexly structured according to schedules and programs. Less of their information arises from observation unless in forays into the fields and more arrives before them as Althusser's Generalities 2 or generality, Generalities 3. Their knowledge of the world is composed increasingly within their heads or their theories by non-observational means. They are surrounded on every side by structures. They are surrounded on every side by structures, even their universities, and especially the new ones, are not ar architecturally, ar architectural utterances, but structures with a subterranean basis, visited only by proletarian porters and boilermen, with economics and the social sciences on the first two floors, and philosophy and literature, which can only be reached by elevator at much higher levels. Meanwhile, technology, or what they know of technology by report, is no longer a matter of driving shafts and belts and extending railway communications, but a matter of circuits, intricate gearing, automated programs. The natural sciences report on complex molecular structures and the torque of DNA. Institutions are subjected to systems analysis, and within all this, there arrives, with inevitable punctuality, cybernetics and the computer, which sieves, sorts, and organizes impartially all languages of technology, natural science, sociology, economics, history, on one condition only, that the categories which it ingests shall be unambiguous and constant in conformity with the constancy of its own complex binary program. I do not set all this down in order to reject it in a fit of romantic temper. This is where we live now, and this gives us some of our experience. But this experience must inevitably press into our vocabulary, and in particular, into the vocabulary of analogy. And sometimes we must plainly resist this pressure, when we have reason to suspect that its common sense disguises ideology. Just as Marx had to repudiate the shit of political economies, Malthusian and market analogies, so we must repudiate inappropriate analogies of levels circuits and complex closures. Nor can we allow the computer to dictate that our categories stand still for its convenience. The organic analogies of the 19th century derived from the observation of plants, of stock, of growth, were sometimes improperly applied to human occasions, but they were at least analogies derived not from structure, but from process. But as the observational field of today's theorists becomes more specialized and more segregated from practice, where are they to turn for comparable analogies for a vocabulary of interaction and eventuation? Um, hmm. We might start, I suggest, by observing ourselves. I have hurled sufficient invective at the head of categorical and uh, categorical stasis and what is the alternative an intuitive empirical refusal of theory a historical relativism which demands fresh categories for every context we may be helped at this point by sartre whose thought i cannot as a good englishman always follow in its subtlety nor always ascend to, but whose understanding of history and whose relationship to political reality is altogether superior at every point to that of Althusser. Althusser, like Foucault, sticks to the analysis of structure from the epistemological point of view, 
that amounts to returning to siding with the concepts against the notion. The concept is atemporal. One can study how concepts are engendered, one after the other, within determined categories. But neither time itself nor, consequently, history can be made the object of a concept. There's a contradiction in terms. When you introduce temporality, you come to see that within a temporal development, the concept modifies itself. Notion, on the contrary, can be defined as the synthetic effort to produce an idea which develops itself by contradiction and its successive overcoming, and therefore is homogeneous to the development of things. I'm not sure that I accept this notion, but Sartre's argument conforms closely to my own earlier argument as to the approximate and provisional nature of historical concepts, as to their elasticity and generality, classes, class struggle, as to their character as expectations rather than as rules. It conforms also to vigilant rejection of the closed and static concept or analogy in favor of the open and the shaping formative one, as by replacing law of motion by logic of process and by understanding determinism not as predetermined programming or the implantation of necessity, but in its senses as the setting of limits and the exerting of pressure pressures. It means retaining the notion of structure, but as structural actuation, limits and pressures within a social formation, which remains protean in its forms. It means the refusal of that trick of thought discussed by Raymond Williams in considering basis and superstructure by which the metaphorical terms for a relationship are extended into abstract categories or concrete areas until these analytic categories, as so often in idealist thought have almost unnoticed, become substantive descriptions, which then take habitual priority over the whole social process, to which as analytic categories they are attempting to speak. It means that even when we decide for legitimate reasons to isolate certain activities for distinct analysis, as we may do with modes of production or economic process, we do not allow ourselves to be deluded by our own procedures into supposing these systems to be distinct. It means that in such procedures we employ a special care when we come to those junction terms, which lie at the point of junction between analytic disciplines. As need in economics, which may be seen as a norm in anthropology, or between structure and process, as class and mode of production, which lie forever on those borders. This is not all. We need also more historical thought, a greater theoretical self-consciousness as to our own concepts and procedures, and more effort by historians to communicate their findings to others in theoretically cogent forms. In all the chatter of theoretical practice about modes of production, pre-capitalist formations, ideology, the labor process, class, the state, ISAs and RSAs, FMPs and CMPs, historians who have made these problems the object of sustained investigation have, in general, been ignored and they have returned the compliment with a disdainful silence. Communication will flow in both directions, of course. But what we do not need is a theory of history, in Althusser's sense. For this theory will be nothing but a thin enigma unless it is fattened on the content of substantive historical analysis. If we want to know how autonomous and relative to what, we may think the problem, but then we must find out and think again about our findings. We must put theory to work, and we may do this either by interrogating evidence, research, or by interrogating historiography and other theories, critique, and both these methods were the ones most commonly employed by Marx. Theoretical practice, which, re which rejects the first procedure, empiricism, and which reduces the second procedure to caricature by measuring all other positions against its own pre-given orthodoxy, is evidence of nothing but the self-esteem of its authors. For the project of grand theory to find a total systematized conceptualization of all history and human occasions is the original heresy of metaphysics against knowledge. It is not only that this is like trying to catch running water in a sieve, 
It is not only that we can never reproduce with finality within the forms of thought. History that never sleeps or dies and held one moment burns the hand. It is not only that the attempt to do so in a science devoid of substance ends up very much like Engels's characterization of the Hegelian inheritance, a compilation of words and turns of speech which had no other purpose than to be at hand at the right time where thought and positive knowledge were lacking. All this is not all. The project itself is misbegotten. It is an exercise of closure, and it stems from a kind of intellectual agoraphobia, an anxiety before the uncertain and the unknown, a yearning for security within the cabin of the absolute. As such, it reproduces old theological modes of thought, and its constructions are always elaborated from ideological materials. More than this, such total systems have, very generally, been at enmity with reason and censorious of freedom. They seek not only to dominate all theory or to expel all other theories as heresies, but also to reproduce themselves within social reality. Since theory is a closure, history must be brought to conform. They seek to lasso process in their categories, bring it down, break its will, and subject it to their command. Within the last instance, we find the anagram of Stalin. Nor is this all, there is also the matter of dialectics. Many critics have noted that Althusser has extruded, along with Hegel, dialectics. This should be apparent without further demonstration. I do not mean his extrusion of this or that law of dialectics, as in his commendation of Stalin for his prescience in challenging the credentials of the negation of the negation. The ontological status of any such laws is questionable. I mean that even in the moment that Althusser, whoa, what happened there? I mean that even in the moment that Althusser claims la dialectique and boasts possessively as to his intimacy with her, he strikes her into a statuesque pose. And in that pose, we recognize once again our old friend, la, la structure à dominante. She is modeling a new gown, which superbly expresses her inner contradictory nature. Uh, quote by Althusser, this reflection of the conditions of existence, of the contradiction within itself, this, re this reflection of the structure articulated in dominance that constitutes the unity of the complex whole within each contradiction, this is the most profound characteristic of the Marxist dialectic. End quote. This gown is a reflection of contradiction, and the creation is presented to us by its designer under the name Over Determination. The gown is fitted perfectly to the model's form, but it is so tight that she cannot move. In all of Althusser's texts, dialectics conceived as the logic of the logic of process never appears. My readers will eagerly anticipate that a hundred page disquisition on dialectics will now ensue. I am sorry to disappoint them. It is beyond my competence. I wish only to make a few observations, situating myself on the outside of an argument into whose complexities I would be foolhardy to enter. First, I am of the opinion that the understanding of dialectics can only be advanced if an absolute embargo is placed upon the mention of Hegel's name. This will appear to be absurd and whimsical, but I mean to argue it through. Manifestly, Engels and Marx owed their dialectics to Hegel, often returned to Hegel, and often acknowledged their debt. All this has been examined by others and with much ability, and I do not dispute the value of the examination. One day it should be resumed, but at this point the, dis the discussion is not only exhausted, it has become counterproductive. For its tendency has been to align its protagonists into Hegelian Marxists, who with whatever efforts at inversion tend to see dialectics as a Hegelian suffusion within process. And anti-Hegelians, whether empirical historicists or Althusserians, who tend in effect to discard dialectics along with Hegel. But second, the account which theorists offer of their procedures need not be the same thing as those procedures themselves. We may agree to reject the account which Engels offered in the dialectics of nature, but the, mature, but the matter cannot be ended there. 
there still remained the very motions of thought implicit in many passages of Marx and Engels, or Engels's analysis, their procedures and their self-consciousness of these procedures. When old, when old Engels thundered out to Schmidt, what these gentlemen all lack is dialectic. He went on to adduce not dialectical laws, but the mode of apprehension of a fluent and contradictory eventuation. They never see anything but hear a cause in their effect, that this is a hollow abstraction, that such metaphysical polar opposites only exist in the real world during crises, while the whole vast process proceeds in the form of interaction, though of very unequal forces, the economic movement being by far the strongest, most elemental and most decisive, and that here everything is relative and nothing is absolute. This they never begin to see. It is true that the letter ends, Hegel never existed for them. Hegel inverted, taught them to see in this way. But let us think more about the seeing and less about the teacher. The great, great grandchildren of these gentlemen have read their logic upside down and backwards, but they have been taught nothing. Contradiction is an antagonism, a motor of struggle. It is not a moment of coexistent opposed possibilities. Reformism must be incorporation within capitalist structures. It cannot also be reforms in the modification of those structures to allow a space for incorporation, and so on and on and on. They never see anything but hear cause and their effect. Thus, it is always possible that, as Marx remarked of Spinoza, the real inner structure of his system is, after all, wholly different from the form in which he consciously presented it. And third, even if we set aside Hegel, we will still have to deal with William Blake. I offer Blake, not as a hitherto unrecognized tutor of Marx, but in order to emphasize that the dialectic was not Hegel's private property. Blake reminds us of a very old, sometimes reputable, sometimes arcane hermetic tradition, often a tradition of poets which sought to articulate modes of apprehension appropriate to a reality which was always in flux, in conflict, in decaying, and in becoming. Against the single vision of mechanical materialism, Blake sought and succeeded to think coexist, coexistent contrary states, and to marry heaven and hell. We must agree that Hegel was the vector through whom the tradition was transmitted to Marx, and we may agree that this transmis transmission was an ambiguous inheritance and that Hegel's attempt to, to objectify a mode of apprehension as laws was invalid, but this does not invalidate the mode of apprehension. I am suggesting that Hegel obscures our vision. He gets between us and the light. If we set him aside, we may then more easily look directly at dialectics themselves. I am not certain that we shall see, except, or I'm sorry, I am not certain what we shall see, except that it will certainly not be contradiction caught in a stationary pose. The attempt to see a logic inscribed within natural process itself has been disabling and misleading, but from another aspect, we seem to be offering a description within the terms of logic of the ways in which we apprehend this process. I am, certainly, I am certain only that this mode of apprehension of double-edged, double-tongued process is to be found in Marx and Engels' own practice. And here I may speak confidently for others within my tradition, that in my own work as a historian I have repeatedly observed this kind of process, and have, in consequence, come to bring dialectics not as this or that law, but as a habit of thinking, in coexisting opposites or contraries, and as an expectation as to the logic of process, into my own analysis. How else are we to be prepared to understand the paradox that the apparent agent of socialist revolution, the CPSU, B, has become the organ which, above all, articulates and imposes upon the self-activating social and intellectual process of Russian society a system of blockade? The eviction of dialectics from the Althusserian system is deplorable, but it flows as a necessary consequence from the inner stasis of structuralism. I am less sure that there is much to be gained from giving to the dialectic elaborate, logical, and formal expression. 
We've often been told that Marx had a method, that this method lies somewhere in the religion of dialectical reason, or sorry, in the region of dialectical reason. Did I say religion? I don't know, region of dialectical reason, and that this constitutes the essence of Marxism. It is therefore strange that, despite many allusions and several expressions of intent, Marx never wrote this essence down. Marx left many notebooks. Notebooks. He was nothing if not a self-conscious and responsible intellectual worker. If he had found the clue to the universe, he would have set a day or two aside to put it down. We may conclude from this that it was not written because it could not be written any more than Shakespeare or Stendhal could have reduced the art to a clue. For it was not a method but a practice, and a practice learned through practicing, so that in this sense dialectics can never be set down, nor learned by rote. They must be learned only by critical apprenticeship within the same practice. We will take leave of the section with some different observations. I promised at the outset to eschew the method of swapping quotations from Marx. I am not interested in the defense of Marxism as an orthodoxy, but we, can, but we cannot dismiss as irrelevant the question as to whether Althusser's reading of Marx is authorized, whether indeed Marx's work had been misrecognized as a historicism when it was always a structuralism offering premonitions of the Althusserian orrery. A sufficient way of answering this question will be to note several of the devices which Althusser employs to validate his reading, not only as truly orthodox, but as more orthodox than Marx. We have noted one device in the motor to gloss a text, thesis of the Communist Manifesto, and to invent from this gloss a basic Marxist proposition. We have noted another in the transmutation of analogies into concepts and of analytic categories into substantive descriptions. A further essay could follow here on the Althusserian employment of in the last instance. The last instance may be variously rendered into English as in the last analysis, in the court of last resort, ultimately in the final judgment. That fine communist scholar, Donator, working 1000 miles outside of academia, who first translated and edited the selected correspondence in 1934, in those incredibly dim days when, as we were assured by Eagleton, Anderson, and a dozen others, soidescent British Marxists had nothing in their hands but a few impoverished polemical tracts. Donator first rendered the passage in Engels's letter to Bloch, that passage which becomes the axle of Althusser's oratory, but which we recall is abstracted from a letter which also supplies the script in which the old man is made to play a clown. She rendered it thus. According to the materialist conception of history, the, de the determining element in history is ultimately the production and reproduction in real life. More than this, neither Marx nor I have asserted. Thus, in Letzer instance, appears first as ultimately, and later in the letter as in the last resort. And at the asterisk, Tor allowed herself one of her rare editorial intrusions. Moment, element in the dialectical process of becoming. She was already, it seems, 40 years ago, keeping a watchful eye on the horizon for the arrival of Althusser. This is what Althusser gives. Production is the determinant factor. Production itself being another category which he and Balabar are intent to stabilize and reify. And how can a last analysis then become an instance at a levels, at a levels a political instance or a legal instance assigned on operative indica indicative force by la structure a dominant, domin domin fuck, dominant. What are we to make of Polancis's definition? By mode of production, we shall designate a specific combination of various structures and practices, which in combination appears as so many instances and levels. How can a mode of production appear as so many instances analyses, judgments, last resorts, unless it has become a metaphysical mode, producing neither goods nor knowledge, but 
but reproducing itself endlessly in differentiating levels and instances, engendering only theoretical famine. But the truth is, they be not the highest instances that give the securest information, as may be well expressed in the tales so common of the philosopher, that while we gazed upwards to the stars fell into the water. Um, for if he had looked down, he might have seen the stars in the water, but looking aloft, he could not see the water and the stars. We might describe this last device as transplantation. An organ of one argument is cut out and put into the, the side of another. A more familiar device has already been well described as ventriloquism. Althusser rarely allows Marx to speak. When he does, he throws his own voice into Marx. Or, which is little different, he produces Marx, prepares the scene, rehearses the script, presents a cue, and then a few lines proper to that moment of the scene are permitted. Let us follow through one example. Althusser has noted with delight a footnote in capital, and moreover a note only to be found in the French edition, defining the word process. The word proems, process, which expresses a development considered in the totality of its real conditions has long been part of scientific language throughout Europe. In France, it was first introduced slightly shamefacedly in its Latin form, processus. Then, stripped of this pedantic disguise, it slipped into books on chemistry, physics, physiology, etc., and into works of metaphysics. In the end, it will obtain a certificate of complete naturalization. The production requires at this point that Marx should speak a few lines to authorize Althusser's thesis of history as a process without a subject. Moreover, he wishes to catch the word process which the knowledgeable reader will know that Marx used rather freely and put it under arrest. If historical process can be defined as a development considered in the totality of its real conditions, then it can be put back inside structure as a mechanism to turn the orary around. One way, an honest way of approaching this question might have been through examining Marx's arguments in capital at some central places in the text but Althusser prefers a footnote limited to the French edition. He offers these lines as his authority. Why then did Marx choose such an obscure way to express a point of such importance? A chauvinist reply would be, because only the French reader could have the logic to comprehend a point so nice. But Althusser at this point is no chauvinist. He has a better argument. It was only the three or four years interval which had elapsed since the publication of Capital in German, which had permitted Marx to clarify his own thought, which had allowed him to grasp the importance of this category and to express it to himself. This is the production, or this is the production. It is superb, but the producer gets little assistance from his script. The dramatist has nodded, for the note defines the process or for the note defines the word process as employed indifferently within works of chemistry, physics, physiology, and metaphysics. The note says nothing, absolutely nothing, about how Marx sets the, work to work, the word to work about Marx's notion of historical process. For this, we must refer to his books. And it is self-evident from the note that it has been inserted in the French edition because the word has not yet been allowed naturalization is unfamiliar in political and economic theory, or so Marx supposes, possibly, possibly because it offended against the fixity of categories in French logic, possibly because French intellectuals scrutinize with care the credentials of alien conceptual intruders before they are permitted familiar access to their discourse. And I do not say this in criticism of the French. British intellectuals so anxious to Europeanize themselves might learn something here from the caution of the French. There are some recent intruders, conjuncture, overdetermination, instance, structure and dominance, whose certificates of naturalization should be refused. We have noted these devices, invention, transmutation of analogies into concepts, improper conceptual transplants, ventriloquism or production.
The most general device, however, is the employment of readings, which are partial to which, or which, are, fuck, which are partial, or which are wholly misleading, and in ways which cannot be innocent. As a final example, we will follow one of these. We have already noted that Althusser, at an important place in his argument, cites the authority of the poverty of philosophy, Marx's polemic in 1847 against Proudhon. How indeed could the single logical formula of movement of sequence of time explain the body of society in which all economic relations coexist simultaneously and support one another? This appears, as we have seen, at a critically important stage of his argument for a structurally synchronic mode of analysis. I do not think that there is any other text of Marx's which he works harder. This text is his license to own an orary, orary, orary. <laughs> it is employed at least, it is employed at at least four significant points in reading capital. It is rigorously expressed in those few lucid sentences. Marx warns us that he is looking not for an understanding of the mechanism of the production of society as a result of history, but for an understanding of the mechanism of the production of the society effect by this result. These sentences in a work which comes directly after the epistemological break, one of the first utterances of the mature Marx, are indeed of absolutely decisive scope. They direct us to the essence of his revolution in theory, his discovery of science. It is not clear why this is so, but it is clear that the sentence must be supported by its context. To this we must return. The context is chapter two of the poverty of philosophy, entitled The Metaphysics of Political Economy, and commencing with some observations on method. What has most annoyed Marx in La Philosophie de la Misère is Proudhon's pretension to a new metaphysical method. We are not giving a history according to the order in time, but according to the sequence of ideas. In place of the sequence of actual history, Proudhon proposes to develop economic theories in their logical sequence and their serial relation in the understanding. It is this order that we flatter ourselves to have discovered. Marx's several observations develop most emphatically different aspects of the same objection, the metaphysical and unhistorical character of Proudhon's method. Bourgeois economists have developed the division of labor, credit, money, etc. as fixed, immutable, eternal categories, but they do not explain the historical movement that gave them birth. Proudhon takes these categories from the economists as given and wishes to put them into a new sequential order, a serial relation in the understanding. The economist's material is the active, energetic life of man. M. Proudhon's material is the dogmas of the economists. But the moment we cease to pursue the historical movement of production relations, of which the categories are but the theoretical expression, we are forced to attribute the origin of these thoughts to the movement, to the movement of pure reason. This Marx sees as the heresy of metaphysics. Everything is presented not in the analysis of social and historical reality, but as a sequence of abstracted logical categories. Thus, the metaphysicians who, in making these abstractions, think they are making analyses, and who, the more they detach themselves from things, imagine themselves to be getting all the nearer to the point of penetrating their core. These metaphys metaphysicians, in turn, are right in saying that things here below are embroideries of which the logical categories constitute the canvas. We sit uncomfortably and remember society, effect, and men as Traeger, embroideries upon the canvas of structure. Marx thunders on. If all that exists, all that lives on land and underwater can be reduced by abstraction to a logical category, if the whole real world can be drowned thus in a world of abstractions, in the world of logical categories, who need be astonished at all? All that exists, all that lives on land and underwater, exists and lives only by some kind of movement. Proudhon has at least noticed this and he seeks to enclose movement within his categories by means of a crude deployment of the Hegelian dialectic. 
but what he has done is to abstract movement itself into a series of logical categories. Apply this method to the categories of political economy, and you have the logic and metaphysics of political economy. Or, in other words, you have the economic categories that everybody knows translated into a little-known language, which makes them look as if they had newly blossomed forth in an intellect of pure reason. So much do these categories seem to engender one another, to be linked up and intertwined with one another, by the very working of the dialectic movement. We are now beginning to understand why Althusser held his hand so firmly over the text of the poverty of philosophy, and allowed us only to peep through his fingers at one single sentence. But if we are to understand the context of this sentence, and therefore Marx's meaning, we have to turn back for a moment from chapter 2, The Method, to chapter 1, where Marx makes an entry directly into the question of Proudhon's concept of value. Proudhon seeks to explain the genesis of exchange value, not in its real historical genesis, but in its genesis within a sequence of logical categories. The history is that of the genesis of ideas in serial relation in the understanding. Proudhon presents this sequence in this kind of way. Since a very large number of the things I need occur in nature only in moderate quantities, or even at all, I am forced to assist in the production of what I lack. And as I cannot set my hand to so many things, I shall propose to other men, my collaborators in various functions, to see to me a part of their products in exchange for mine. As Marx remarks elsewhere, this is a characteristic petty bourgeois notion of economic relations. The T is a little master hatter or brass founder who would exchange in this way if the state taxation feudal privilege did not intervene. From this logical sequence, a history but a history only in ideas or ideology, Proudhon derives the division of labor. As Marx remarks, a man sets out to propose to other men that they establish exchange, but Proudhon has not explained the genesis of this proposal. How is this single individual, this Robinson, suddenly had the idea of making to his collaborators a proposal of the type known and how these collaborators, collaborators accepted it without the slightest protest? This is a sample of what Proudhon describes as his historical and descriptive method. The logical sequence of categories, one engendering the next in series, may then be placed within a small balloon named T, and this balloon may then be puffed up with rhetoric until, until it has become the impersonal reason of humanity. Or at another place, Prometheus, who emerging from the bosom of nature, sets to work and on this first day, his product is equal to 10. On the second day, Prometheus divides his labor and his product becomes equal to 100. On the third day, Prometheus invents machines, discovers new utilities and bodies, new forces in nature. But we scarcely need to rehearse Marx's critique. This is to invert the real historical sequence. Labor is organized is divided differently according to the instruments it, ha it has at its disposal. The hand mill presupposes a different division of labor from the steam mill. Thus, it is slapping history in the face to want to begin with a division of labor in general, in order to arrive subsequently at a specific instrument of production, machinery. In the sense, it is the machine which historically discovers the division of labor and determines its particular forms. We cannot usefully discuss the production of wealth without the historical conditions in which it was produced. But this Prometheus, put this Prometheus back into history, and what does it turn out to be? It is society, social relations based on class antagonism. These relations are not relations between individual and individual, but between worker and capitalist, between farmer and landlord, etc. Wipe out these relations and you annihilate all society. Thus, the whole of the poverty of philosophy, a remarkable and cogent polemic, is a set of variations upon the theme of Proudhon's unhistorical metaphysics. This gives us the context and hence the meaning of Althusser's one sentence, license. Economic categories are the abstractions of the social relations of production, but these relations are continually in movement, 
and the categories themselves are historical and transitory project products. Proudhon seeks to wrest the categories from their context, etern eternize them, and then reorder them as a serial relation in the understanding. He does not wish to present history according to the order in time. This real history is, in Proudhon's view, only the historical sequence in which the categories have manifested themselves. But we can improve upon real history by taking the economic categories successively one by one. As a result, for Proudhon, everything happened in the pure ether of reason. But we cannot detach economic categories from their context in this way, since the production relations of every society form a whole. Proudhon's serial relation of categories in the understanding leads him to consider economic relations as so many social phases engendering one another, resulting one from the other like the antithesis from the thesis, and realizing in their logical sequence the impersonal reason of humanity. But we cannot analyze productive relations, economic relations, as this kind of series, since all the relations and the categories coexist and presuppose each other. We must take these, these together as one set. To arrive at value, Proudhon could not do without division of labor, competition, etc. Yet in the series, in the logical sequence, these relations did not yet exist. In constructing the edifice of an ideological system by means of the categories of political economy, the limbs of the social system are dislocated. The different limbs of society are converted into so many separate societies following one upon the other. How indeed could the single logical formula of movement, of sequence, of time, explain the structure of society in which all relations coexist simultaneously and support one another. We have arrived at last at Althusser's talisman, the jewel of absolutely decisive scope. But Marx is not finished. In the next observations he posts on, Proudhon has dislocated the limbs of the social system and given these as separate societies. Production, exchange, a monetary system, dis distribution, following one upon the other in a logical categorical sequence. We have to reconstitute these limbs and see them as acting together. But how are we to do this unless within real history, the history within which these relations were engendered? When we do this, we return once again to the point of origin of the economist's material, the active energetic life of man. And when we do so, the illusion of bourgeois economics, that society is the effect of categories and that men are the carriers of structures, is at last dispelled. We are necessarily forced to examine minutely what men were like in the 11th century, what they were like in the 18th, what were their respective needs, their productive forces, their mode of production, the raw materials of their production. In short, what were the relations between man and man which resulted from all these conditions of existence? To get to the bottom of all these questions, what is this but to draw up the real profane history of man in every century and to present these men as both the authors and the actors of their own drama? Does the point need explaining further? Arguments as well as product, production relations form a whole. We cannot sever one limb and that limb a tiny one one sentence, the upper joint of a little finger. Marx's argument is that no point in argument against historicism. It is an argument for integrative historical analysis against the disintegrative single logical formula of Proudhon as a serial relation of categories. Moreover, we can now understand Althusser's silence as to the substantial arguments of the poverty of philosophy. For the heresies which Althusser wishes to unmask, the heresy of empiricism, to examine minutely what men were like, the heresy of historicism, the real profane history of men, and the heresy of humanism as both the authors and the actors of their own drama, these heresies do not appear merely as the momentary blank of suspended rigor, scarcely the time of a lightning flash in the darkness of the text. These are integral to the text. They are the argument, they are the thunder and the lightning which are hurled against Proudhon's darkness. Moreover, it is only necessary to perform one small operation upon Marx's text by changing at every point the name of Proudhon to Althusser 
and it may be read as a sustained premonitory polemic against the latter's theory. It is true that Althusser has replaced Proudhon's sequential logic with an inconsequential logic, but the polemic strikes home every time. The fixity of categories, the engenderment of categories from pure reason rather than through historical analysis, analysis. The metaphysical heresy, categories engendering society and man as their effects. The mystifying novelty of the vocabulary. The reorganization of real history into a more proper categorical logic as the development of forms. Structure swallowing process. The disintegrative method which separates a whole into limbs, levels, instances. The manipulation of these limbs in an ether of pure reason independently of the specificities of historical time and class. In going to the office of authority and taking out this text, M. Althusser has made a mistake, a big mistake. I think M is supposed to be Mr. Mr. Althusser. <laughs> How did I not know that? Um, what he supposed was a license to entertain the public with his orary was in fact a court order to put down his own dog theoretical practice, and the order is signed Karl Marx, and the order must be executed instantly by the public if Althusser refuses, for the dog has bitten philosophy and sociology already and made them mad. A final observation, we will propose it in the form of a question. How does Althusser have the neck? Um, 13. So many pages. I didn't say that, that's written on this. And yet we have only traced two of Althusser's ogres, historicism and empiricism, to their lairs. Somewhere in the forest, those even more hideous monsters, humanism and moralism, still lurk. But I do not think that we will need so many pages to find them. As we have seen, a ball rolls down the hill th through its own innate energy and will. All of Althusser's subsequent propositions roll down in the same way once he has placed them on this idealist summit. It should also be clear by now that these propositions belong not to reason or to science, but to ideology, and therefore we can dispatch, dispatch, dispatch them somewhat more briskly. That men and women are not agents in their own history, but treasure, treasure, treasure carriers of structures, vectors of process, must follow upon the concept of a process without a subject. To suppose otherwise is to fall into the sin of humanism. Althusser's first elaborated anathema against this sin appeared in an article, Marxism and Humanism, in 1964. Why did it appear then? We shall see. But to see, we must make ourselves into historians for a moment. I am sure that my most critical readers will not accuse me of having confused, up to this moment, theory with the sociology of ideology. Our critique has been rigorous within theory and its discourse of the proof. Well, most of the time, not a syllable of the partisan or the personal has been allowed to intrude, not often. Now, however, we must not only admire Althusser's orary, which we shall continue to do, but ask also why it was made and whom it was intended to entertain. But first, the text. This is how it commences. Today, socialist humanism is on the agenda. As it enters the period which will lead it from socialism to communism, the Soviet Union has proclaimed the slogan, all for man and introduced new themes, the freedom of the individual, respect for legality, the dignity of the person. This is a historical event, Althusser goes on. It is premonitory of a dialogue between communists and men of goodwill who are opposed to war and poverty. Today, even the high road to humanism seems to lead to socialism. But this is only a seeming. In fact, humanism, man, is a very foul bourgeois ideological concept and one to which Marx himself was victim in his early manuscripts. He liberated himself from this concept in the course of his encounter with Feuerbach. The argument, the argument of Engels' Ludwig Feuerbach, is too familiar to rehearse. 
Beneath the grand phrases of humanity was concealed the exploitation of the bourgeoisie of the proletariat. Hence, revolutionary proletarian humanism could only be a class humanism. For more than 40 years in the USSR, amidst gigantic struggles, socialist humanism was expressed in the terms of class di dictatorship rather than in those of personal freedom. But the end of the dictatorship of the proletariat in the USSR opens up a second historical phase. In the USSR, men are indeed now treated without any class distinction, that is, as persons. This is according to Althusser. So in ideology, we see the themes of class humanism give way before the themes of a socialist humanism of the person. Very nice. But before we can order a stock of the same commodity for ourselves, we are sternly reminded that it is a product, not of theory, but of ideology. Ideology is as such an organic part of every social totality. Like it or not, even socialist states must have ideology. Human societies secrete ideology as the very element and atmosphere indispensable to their historical respiration in life. But this particular ideological stock cannot be exported from the USSR. Indeed, it is a seed carefully prepared only for Siberian conditions. The world opening up before the Soviets is one with infinite vistas of progress, of science, of culture, of bread and freedom, of free development, a world that can do without shadows or tragedies. But that is their world, not ours. The themes of socialist humanism, free, de free development of the individual, respect for socialist legality, dignity of the person, etc., are the way the Soviets and other socialists are living the relations between themselves and these problems, that is, the conditions in which they are posed. If we live in different conditions, we cannot cultivate the same crops. In China, etc., only a class humanism can as yet be grown. And what of the capitalist West? Very clearly, the stock cannot be imported, for it would be transmogrified in the passage and would spring up in these conditions as a virulent bourgeois crop of anti-communism. <clears throat> it would come up not as socialist at all, but as the old ideological notion of man. For we must not forget for an instant the difference between ideology and sciences, and that the frontier separating ideology from scientific theory was crossed about 120 years ago by Marx. Strictly in respect to theory, therefore, one can and must speak of Marx's theoretical anti-humanism. Simply put, the recourse to ethics so deeply inscribed in every humanist ideology may play the part of an imaginary treatment of real problems. Once known, these problems are posed in precise terms. They are organizational problems of the forms of economic life, um, political life, and individual life. These problems must be given their scientific names. Thus, we see that in theory, while it may do for the Soviet Union as ideology, i.e. rhetoric, socialist humanism is the old enemy. It is the couple, abstract goodwill, moralism, and man, humanism, in partnership against real communism. Very nice again, but who are the trigger or vectors of these hideous ideological impurities? Can we envisage bourgeois socialist humanism in corpor, corpor vile and give it a local uh, habitation and a name? Who is the ogre? We shall see. But first we must make two general observations on Althusser's procedures. One, there is a method of theoret theoretical practice which I will describe as the kangaroo factor. We have noted long ago that this kind of idealism, since it prohibits any actual empirical engagements with social reality, is delivered, bound, and gagged into the hands of the most vulgar empiricism. That is, since it cannot know the world, the world must be assumed in its premises. And what is that world but the most vulgar manifestations and prejudi prejudices of what everyone knows? Hence, the theoretical practitioner proceeds in gigantic bounds through the conceptual elements with the most gracious curvatures of thought. 
and while he is bounding, he performs, performs the most elegant acrobatic twirls, and he pays the air with sublime gestures. But every so often, since the law of gravity cannot be disregarded forever, he comes down, bump. What he comes down upon is an assumption about the world. What he does not linger on this assumption, or but he does not linger on this assumption, sniff it, taste the grass, hop, he's off into the air again. I apologize, the analogy is grossly unfair to kangaroos, which bound forward with a purposive air to an objective, keep their paws tidily in place, and every now and then stop, eat, and survey the world. Theory hops onwards forever, even through the Stalinist night. Of course, if the reader shares already all of Althusser's common sense, that the Soviet Union in 1964 was a, a land living the themes of dignity of the person, free development of the individual, respect for legality, etc., with infinite vistas of progress, a world without shadows or tragedies, then my analogy is wasted upon him, and he had better stop reading this essay since these pearls are not for him. We shall notice the kangaroo factor again. 2. The second observation, Althusser's theoretical practice may be defined as a contestation without an opponent. Throughout for Marx and reading capital, his antagonists are scarcely ever, unless in an illusion, a footnote, defined. The practice is that of monologue, not, di not dialogue, within the corpus of Marx's concepts. But this is not strictly true, as a few points opponents are defined, and these are young Marx, Hegel, mature Marx, his blanknesses and failures of rigor, poor old Engels, and Gramsci. I will not turn aside to defend that creative but ambiguous thinker. He does not require my defense, and he is defenders enough. Apart from these moments of argument and argument which is produced, we have not particular ogres, antagonists who developed particular arguments in definite places, but a generic ogreism. We have empiricism without any empiricists, historicism without any attention to historians, and now we have humanism and moralism without any faces. But no matter, we cannot see these ogres for a very good reason. They are hidden within the dense undergrowth of the forest of bourgeois ideology. But then a very strange thing occurs. Suddenly in 1972, an ogre does shamble out of the forest, dazzled and confused in the unaccustomed daylight. Hurriedly, an orthodox communist audience is gathered around. And then in the arena of theory, a supreme tournament is staged with an actual antagonist, Dr. John Lewis. And why should he choose this opponent? We shall see. Who was John Lewis? It is Althusser's whimsy. For even rigor may be allowed its little jokes to offer him as a youngish philosopher, perhaps a man of goodwill, who was trying to be a Marxist, but who would not overcome the influence of Sartre. And not as he was, the elderly guardian of the tablets of the British Communist Party's ideological law. Between 1945 and 1956, during the era of high Stalinism, Lewis was the editor of the party's intellectual organ, the modern quarterly. The young are uncharitable, as I am now old enough to know, and no doubt I and, no doubt I and my immediate friends in the Communist Party in those days took an uncharitable view of Lewis in seeing him as a superintendent among King Street's ideological police, along with Burns, Dutt, Garman, Klugman and company. That is, in intellectual and cultural matters, he was two fixed points between which a correct line could always be drawn. His own specialty, and he gave himself a generous allowance of the jur journal's pages, was homiletics on communism and ethics, morality and humanism. Now this seems at first sight to conform exactly to Althusser's requirements. Lewis, Lewis is taken as a triple personification of the ogre, dogmatism, the ogre humanism, and the ogre moralism. These three ogres of bourgeois origin had slipped unobserved from, that, from their natural habitat into the forest of Stalinism. 
In unmasking, Louis Althusser is taking even further his long and rigorous project of unmasking the Stal Stalinian deviation. And it is the easier for him to do this by selecting an elderly target in the British Communist Party, which the leaders of the PCE have always despised, rather than an ogre in his own party, which might always bite back. Moreover, Althusser is able to present himself as being way ahead of his own lagging times in the avant-garde of theory. In For Marx, that is, in 1965, I was already writing about Stalin, about the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party, and about the split in the international communist movement. John Lewis, on the other hand, writes as if Stalin had never existed. But this is in fact not a tourney at all. It is a race in the same direction between two kangaroos. It is true that, while in the air, the kangaroos make different noises in different national idioms. But since every other country is now allowed its own national Marxism, why should not Anglo-Marxism be allowed? If Franco-Marxism is permitted to utter, in Cartesian tones, the lemons of raison, why should Anglo-Marxism not emit, in the organ tones of Unitarian or Theosophist chapel, the homilies of moral man? But both kangaroos hop to the same rhythm, go the same way, and land from time to time, bump on the same clumps of unexamined common sense. The party, Marxism, Leninism, and astounding illusions as to Soviet history and contemporary reality. What Althusser is saying as to bourgeois humanism, as ideology, and as to proletarian class humanism, embodied in the dictatorship of the proletariat in the Soviet Union, embodied in the party guided by Marxist science, is exactly what Lewis was saying in the high Stalinist years, and saying repetitiously to the exclusion of all other themes. This was Lewis's thing. In 1946, the great moral muddle, he started off hopping at the same point at which Althusser commenced in 1964. The soberest estimate of Soviet achievement, based on the reports of the most cautious investigators, reveal a respect for personality, an achievement of freedom from want and insecurity, an equality of opportunity that has filled the Soviet people with boundless confidence and hope. But Lewis saw all this placed on the agenda as early as the new Soviet constitution in 1936, in which Stalin proclaimed the equality of rights for citizens, secured by legal guarantees. He did not, he did not neglect to take us through the same Feuerbach routines. Ethics can only be understood in terms of the class interests they are called upon to serve. To make an ideal effective, it must become the ideal of a class, that is to say it must express the actual interest of a class. That was a quote from um, Lewis. Thus we have Althusser's class humanism. Hence also the new humanism of socialism realized. This does not arise from metaphysical principles or from the acceptance of some utopian ideal or set of abstract moral principles. On the contrary, it must be seen, like Althusser's ideology, as the moral aspect of a particular mode of production. This is the basis of the new morality in Russian, the moral complex complexion of our people, 1951. But like Althusser again, for they are both still way up in the air at the apex of their graceful curve, there's the same stern prohibition upon the import to the capitalist world of the new morality in the form of abstract principles. It is against the background of the complete moral collapse of bourgeois society that we have to put the bad conscience, which projects all the wickedness of which it is guilty upon the new and nobler world that is coming to birth. The stalwart champions of eternal principles must be exposed as wearing class interests behind the mask of absolute values. But there is no need for the proletariat to wear this mask. For the realization of proletarian aims makes possible for the first time a truly human morality. This is achieved by means of a class victory inspired by a class morality. There's no other way in which morality which is above classes can be realized. It is here, it is here that the gestures and tones of Lewis and Althusser both still way up diverge a little. The accents of um, I'm lost. 
the accents of raison and those of moral plenitude. This is a quote from Lewis. Because the workers know that in fighting for their own emancipation, they are fighting for all mankind, the ethical drive behind their movement far exceeds both in purity and intensity, that which inspired all preceding systems of class ethics, and becomes one of the most potent of those energizing and mobilizing forces which, as Stalin has pointed out, play such a vital part in the development of society." End quote. Now both our moralists descend to the ground and not very far from the point they started from. This ground for Althusser is the Soviet world with infinite vistas of progress, a world that can do without shadows or tragedies. True, they call this utopia by different names. For Althusser, it is the world of theory realized, of science incarnate. For Lewis, it is the world of truly human man. Um, this is another quote by Lewis. It is because the leading members of the Soviet Commonwealth are imbued with a morality which leads them to respect and care for people that they succeeded in their great task. They owe much of this finely human attitude to Stalin, whose deep wisdom and broad humanity has long inspired the party, as it now inspires the state of which he is the leader. His ethics and the whole of moral aim of the Soviet state are well summed up in his own. Moving declaration in his own moving declaration of the supreme value of human personality. Our leaders, he says, should display the most most solicitous... Oh, fuck. Oh, man. Sorry, I lost my place. Just have to find it again. The most solicitous... Shit. Oh, I think I found it the most solicitous ad attitude towards our workers. We must learn to value people. It is time to realize that of all the valuable capital the world possesses, the most valuable and most decisive is people." End quote. And when did Stalin say this? In his address to, da to the graduates from the Red Army Academy in 1935. How unfortunate it was that so many of these graduates turned out in the next two years to be not people at all, but alien elements, the trigger of capitalist conspiracy who merited liquidation. Lewis then was a very perfect, gentle kangaroo. The rhetoric was different here and there, man, masses, socialist ideology, new morality, but the essential arguments and assumptions of both men were the same. How is it then that John Lewis should shamble in 1972 as the ogre of humanism out of the forests of bourgeois ideology? And how is it that Althusser's arguments, first commenced in 1964, may be presented as the initiation of a rigorous critique of the Stalinian deviation, while Lewis, presenting the same arguments in the years between 1946 and 1956, should be seen as an, an exemplar of that deviation? And why does the whole tourney and the ground on which it is fought seem so unreal? We shall see. I'm sorry to be so tedious. These last pages bore me inexpressibly. <clears throat> but I am trying to unravel a tangle of wool, and I am trying to do this patiently for the benefit of a generation which thinks itself to be post-Stalinist, but which very often is not, whose rigor has enabled them to repudiate, along with historicism, the most elementary knowledge of the immediate past of the communist movement, in Russia, in Britain, in France. This innocence is allowing them to be made every day the victim of a gigantic confidence trick in which resurgent Stalinism presents itself as anti-Stalinism and in which the long, explicit and arduous critique of Stalinism sustained in a thousand places in a thousand struggles on the left is presented as bourgeois ideology. The tourney between these identical twins, dogmatism and dogmatisms, was faked up by Althusser to further this trick. It is all done by mirrors. We have been drawn into an illusionist's parlor. Let us return again to the 1964 article. Why did Althusser then find it necessary to, to demystify socialist humanism? Was it because of some grave error already committed by John Lewis? No. So far as I know, Lewis was not in the habit of coupling those words. But the words stir a faint memory in my mind. 
for there were other people, a lot of other people in leading positions in the international communist movement who were denouncing socialist humanism between 1956 and 1964. Thus I recall Arnold Kettle, the token representative of British culture on the executive of the British Communist Party, denouncing middle-class people, sputtering a lot of pious generalizations about socialist humanism. By these middle-class people, he can scarcely have been referring to himself, nor to John Lewis, nor even to Althusser, who was in 1964 to give muted approval to the term, but only as ideology and only in the Soviet Union. On every side, the mirrors reflect back upon each other, but every one is empty, and none is any actual ogre to be seen. And then, as I screw up my eyes and gaze intently in the nearest mirror, the terrible realization comes. There I am, staring into the bloated visage and bared fangs of the most hideous of ogres. And it is myself. Mr. Althusser has done me the incomparable tribute of addressing an article to me. Readers will, pardon, readers will pardon the egotism of this hyperbole. Of course, we cannot suppose that a publication emanating from Yorkshire would have been attended to in Paris, but I was, from 1957, co-editor of a journal, The New Reasoner, the New Reasoner subtitled A Quarterly Journal of Socialist Humanism. And in the first number of that journal, I was the author of a long, immature, but not, I think, radically mistaken article on socialist humanism, which was, very specifically, a critique of Stalinist ideology and practice. It was part of an international discourse, and if it did not reach Paris, it certainly reached Moscow, for I received more than one tribute from Soviet theorists. This is, this in October 1958, I was singled out for special commendation. One of these crusaders is Edgar Thompson, the acknowledged leader of the British revisionists, one-time editor of The Reasoner, the journal which fell into oblivion so quickly. It was ordered to cease by the EC of the British CPEPT, and now editor of The New Reasoner, which has its inglorious existence today. <clears throat> my, my article on socialist humanism was particularly noted Thompson repeats slanders which are served up in one form or another by revisionists of all shades. In Novi Mir, 1958, the tributes were even more touching. The Journal of Socialist Humanism was noted as being conducted by a group of renegades. The venal scribblers writing in the reactionary imperialist press could well sue the author for plagiarism. Thompson assiduously rehashes their fantasies about Stalinism, um, Stalinism, about the suppression of the individual in the USSR. Fervently, he calls for nothing less than a revolt against Soviet ideology. Like all traitors, like all renegades and anarchists, H. Thompson uses the term socialist humanism as a smokescreen to proclaim the identity of proletarian class morals with an administrative, bureaucratic, despotic attitude to human beings. Calling for a revolt against inhuman inhumanity, this philosophizing slanderer in every possible way counterposes the abstract man in general to society, to the collective, to the communist party. Far-reaching claims for some kind of allegedly new socialist humanism are concluded with the following declaration. It is humanism because it places once Again, real men and women at the center of socialist theory, an aspiration instead of the resounding abstractions. The party, Marxism, Leninism, Stalinism, the two camps, the vanguard of the working class, so dear to, to Stalinism. Perhaps since ogres are notorious for their vanity, I may quote also the next sentence, neglected by Novi Mer, which exposes my hideous project even further. It is socialist because it reaffirms the revolutionary perspectives of communism, faith in the revolutionary potentialities not only of the human race or of the dictatorship of the proletariat, but of real men and women. There my face is, hideous, contorted with renegade malice, drooling with bourgeois spittle. We might notice also that Mr. Ozrov, the gifted theorist of Novi Mer, 
has, antici has anticipated Althusser's method of exposure. This philosophizing slanderer counterposes the abstract man in general to society. Although, although as it happens, I had counterposed real men and women to the abstractions to dear, to dear Stalinism. My premises were men, not in any fantastic isolation or definition, but in their actual empirically perceptible process of development under definite conditions. And quite a lot of those men under the abstract draperies of Marxist orthodoxy were already dead. <clears throat> so let us stop fooling and picking. The wool has come free. I do not know who first revived socialist humanism as the motto of the communist libertarian opposition in 1956, although certainly the new reasoner carried it to some parts of the English-speaking world. But it arose simultaneously in a hundred places and on 10,000 lips. It was voiced by poets in Poland, Russia, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, by factory delegates in Budapest, by communist militants at the eighth plenum of the Polish party, by a communist premier, Imre Nagy, who was murdered for his pains, it was on the lips of women and men coming out of Gaul, and of the relatives and friends of those who never came out. After November 4th, 1956, when Soviet forces blasted into Budapest, there was initiated a general disciplinary action through the international communist movement to reimpose the disciplinary controls of state or party, to reestablish ideological orthodoxy, in effect, to reconstruct within changed conditions, Stalinism without Stalin. This proceeded in differing circumstances in different countries at a different pace and in different forms. In one place, a palpable police action, Nagy shot, Tibur Derry gowled, anti-Stalinist militants of the Budapest Workers' Councils, one or the other. In another place, the expulsion of revisionists, the closure of dissident journals, the re-establishment of the most rigid Stalinist norms of democratic centralism. Alongside this, of course, there was an ideological police action. The main enemy was seen to be not Trotskyism, which was a subordinate tendency within the opposition, but revisionism, renegades, petty bourgeois elements, and their ideological virus was identified as moralism and as socialist humanism. Thus, we can see the emergence of Althusserianism as a manifestation of a general police action within ideology as the attempt to reconstruct Stalinism at the level of theory. This is not to say, things are never as simple as that, that the leaders of the French Communist Party immediately appointed Althusser as chief of ideological police. They distrusted all philosophy as an infected area. Althusser's language was difficult and his rigor, theoretical anti-humanism, deprived them of some antique rhetoric, for the special virtuosity of the older King Ru consisted in demonstrating with apt quotations from Stalin, that whatever happened in the communist world constituted a victory for man. John Lewis has shown us that. It was only after reading Capital, 1965, and after a sharp dispute, that an understanding was come to, and that Waldick Rochette, the Secretary General of the PCF, spent a long day, June 1966, with Althusser, talking about Spinoza. This understanding reproduced an old project of the Enlightenment. The absolute monarch, the party, agreed to be enlightened by the philosoph theory. The price of the pact for Althusser may be seen in a little subsequent tinkering with his orary, ambiguous confessions of theoreticism, and the increasing brutality of his formulations, RSAs and ISAs, philosophy is class struggle, and in his posturings as a veteran militant of true class war, Spelling of the cordate of innumerable arduous contestations with bourgeois heresy, and also, and here's the parlor of mirrors with dogmatism and Stalinism. I am concerned in this essay with theory. I will comment further on the actual history in another place. But I am entitled, as I think, to locate this particular theoretical problem in this way, in terms of chronological time, which, as we know, is ideological. Mr. Althusser is some six years older than me, but in true structural theoretical time, I am, by the same number of years, his political senior. I joined the Communist Party in 1942 at the age of 18. 
Althusser joined the PCF in 1948 at the age of 30. I know nothing about his prior history, which is irrelevant to theory, except that he was active as a member of the Jeune Étudiant Catholique. His initiation into the communist movement came at a time when the volunteerism of the anti-fascist war and the resistance was receding, and the rival structures, political and ideological, of the Cold War had congealed. The whiff of cordite which is brought to us in his reminiscent allusions is not that of men making history, but that of the Stockholm appeal and of the peace movement. That is, of a period in which the necessary struggle for peace was fought by the blind on a ground of falsehood and under the banner of illusion. When the illusions were finally dispelled in 1956, it was Althusser's business to sew up people's eyes and block their ears to put the whole corrupt structure of falsehood back in a more sophisticated form. I was never deceived by the structure for an instant, nor were my comrades and friends. We knew it of old, we knew it all too well. Althusser was for us the ancient enemy, the reasons of Stalinist power. But to a post-Stalinist generation, the trick is past. This rigorous critic, crit, critic of dogmatism, economism, supplies required almost on his own, set himself the arduous task of restoring Marxist science. Already in 1965, he was writing about Stalin. By 1972, he was able to personal, he was able at personal risk to advance a hypothesis as to a Stalinian deviation. Already in, 19, in 1965. So where was Althusser in 1956? We know the answer. In truth, this already should make me uncomfortable as well, as it should all penitent kangaroos. If 1956, why not 1953, 1948, etc.? But how was Althusser's critique so unaccountably postponed? In 1956, it was at length officially revealed that Stalinism had, for decades, been swatting down men like flies, communists and non-communists alike, and after a further nine years, Althusser coughed, came out of his rigorous mediation, or a meditation, and muttered dogmatism. After a further seven years, he coughed again and risked the hypothesis, the hypothesis of a deviation, the posthumous revenge of the Second International. Two or three years later, and he had a few severe words to say about Zdanov and Lysenko. But on the other side of his face, he, was, he has been altogether more voluble and incomparably more severe. The main enemy has been socialist humanism. And yet socialist humanism was above all the voice of a communist opposition, of a total critique of Stalinist practice and theory. How on earth could the Althusserian illusion have been passed even for an instant it had to be supported by other illusions, each of the mirrors of the first. We have time now to admire only three. First, there was the ancient trick, itself a circle of mirrors, which identified all opposition as, by definition, objectively the voice of reactionary imperialism. Proposition one, these critics attack the party, Marxism, etc. Proposition two, but the party is the ultimate good, the guarantee of theory, etc. Proposition three, therefore these critics are enemies of all that is good and objectively, they are imperialist swine. Thus the high theory of Novi Mir, thus Althusser criticism of Stalinism, unless in terms prescribed by his theory stems from the most violent bourgeois anti-communism and Trotskyist anti-Stalinism. <clears throat> Second, reflected across the parlor, the criticism is bourgeois, middle-class people spouting about socialist humanism. This criticism is most commonly found on the spouting lips of middle-class people. As a characterization of the social complexion of the communist opposition in 1956, it is a direct lie. It was not more true of the workers of Poznan, of the spontaneous councils of Budapest, than it was of the initiatives for socialism with a human face in Czechoslovakia in 1968 nor was it true for those who composed the party of socialist humanism in Britain in 1956. For the veteran leader of the Derbyshire, the Derbyshire miners, Bert Wynne, solidarity with our critique meant, as for many others, severing connections within his own heart. 
for the full-time organizer of the Leeds Communist Party, Jim Roche, formulating the positions of a socialist humanism meant getting out his tools and returning to the cutter's bench. For the Pitt delegate from Bellingry, Lawrence Daly, it involved a critique not only in theory but in political practice, as he initiated the Fife Socialist League and carried the highly politically conscious miners of West Fife along in its own discourse of agitation. For the shop stewards convener at Briggs Motor Bodies, Johnny McLaughlin, it involved calling for an organized movement of the Marxist anti-Stalinist left. So that illusion is not only a lie, it is an insolent, insolent and elitist lie, and it stems from an, ulter an ulterior intellectual contempt for the intelligence and moral sensibility of the working class. Third, this lies reflected in Ormolu and guilt mirrors across the parlor. Socialist humanism, being as we know bourgeois, must of course be no more than a supine relapse into bourgeois ideology. Humanism, moralism, USW. This illusion, what does USW mean? I don't know what USW means. This illusion is the more interesting in a theoretical consideration since it is the one commonly passed on intellectuals. Stalinism blocks all exits from its system by defining in advance any possible exit as bourgeois. And alas, in this respect, Trotskyism actually reinforced the Stalinist intellectual system by rehearsing the same legends and setting up identical blocks. Thus, when I offered in 1957 a critique of epistemological reflection theory with reference to Lenin's materialism and imperial criticism, Peter Fryer, a recent convert to Trotskyism, declared that I was waging an all-out assault on the philosophy of dialectical materialism and taking a road which leads inevitably into the swamp of subjectivism and solipsism. Althusser, in a condescending little foreword to my English readers, to for Marx, patiently explains it thus. The critique of Stalinist dogmatism was generally lived by communist intellectuals as a liberation. This liberation gave birth to a profound ideological reaction, liberal and ethical in tendency, which spontaneously rediscovered the old philosophical themes of freedom, man, the human person, and alienation. It's the end of the quote. It must be difficult to speak a theory like this when at every second word one must contort one's features into a knowing leer to signify to the reader that one knows the true meaning of these words behind their apparent meaning. In 1972, he had become more blunt. He had only one recourse to inverted commas. After the 20th Congress, an openly rightist wave carried off to speak only of them. Many Marxist and communist intellectuals, not only in the capitalist countries, but also in the socialist countries. So that is what we all were, an openly rightist wave, almost alone. Althusser confronted the danger. He wrote for Marx to combat the contagion which was menacing us. It is strange that this rightist wave, this contagion, although it swept in men and women of all occupations and ages, should have swept most strongly through the generation of the anti-fascist struggle and the, run and the resistance, through the generations most possessed, still by the illusions of voluntarism, that they were makers of history, the generation which Althusser appears to have missed. This then is the missing protagonist with whom Althusser wrestles in for Marx and reading Capital, the anti-Stalinist revolt, the total intellectual critique which converged for a time under the motto, Socialist Humanism. Please don't misunderstand me. I am not offering Socialist Humanism as an alternative orthodoxy, nor as an adequate definition of all that this critique entailed, nor yet as a motto endorsed on every side. <clears throat> the term has had its own ambiguous history. I am not so tender at the passing of time as to wish to preserve it in theoretical amber but his, if anywhere, is where all these critiques and actions converged. This is the object of Althusser's police action, the unnamed ghost at whom his arguments are directed, but the ghost is allowed no lines of his own. The reader of the post-Stalinist generation is encouraged to suppose him to be some timid intellectual, remote from any political action, 
shocked in his bourgeois moral, moral sensibility, putting on his glasses, peering at Marx's 1844 manuscripts, and collapsing back into a rightist Farabakian complacency. This also is a direct lie. The actual themes of the critique, the structure and organization of the party, the control of the membership by the full-time apparatus, the Moscow orientation and training of that apparatus, the self-perpetuating modes of control, democratic centralism, the panel system, the outlawing of factions, and from thence to the wider political and intellectual themes, none of these themes appear. Of course, if one defines oneself as being in the middle of a sea, then any other waves must be on the right or on the left. The other waves will see it differently. From my own position, I cannot conceive of any wave in the working class movement being further to the right than Stalinism. From any consideration of working class self-activity, socialist liberty, how is it possible to be further to the right than the anti-historicism and anti-humanism of Althusser? But there's a final and ultimate illusion still to be performed. Socialist humanism may be the ghost with which Althusser was arguing, but it turns out this was only the alias for an even greater ghost, the unnamed ogre whose shadow falls across his lines. In 1972, this ogre is finally named. Socialist humanism is the mask of Joseph Stalin. Not Stalin himself, please be clear, for behind the mask, Stalin's visage is unclouded, proletarian and theoretically unblemished. His thought continues to hold itself comfortably above the up uproar in its bases, its line and its and certain of its practices. But in certain other of its practices, we may detect the Stalinian deviation. And this is the twin, economism, humanism, which must always be taken as an ideological pair. Stalin's economism was hidden by declarations which were, in their own way, cruelly humanist. We are to suppose that deviation arose from a certain absent-mindedness, a relapse into the rhetoric of bourgeois ideology. Excessively preoccupied with building a productive base, economism, he slipped into exalted reveries about the new Soviet man and did not notice what was happening to productive relations, i.e. men and women, in between. Hence, socialist humanism, an imaginary treatment of real problems, is only a new projection of the Stalinian deviation. And now a contortionist is brought on to illustrate the trick, a certain Graham Locke, who has felt himself called upon to introduce the latest writings of Althusser and Balabar to a British public, takes up the centre of the parlour and glosses the texts. Economism is to forget about class struggle, and to forget about class struggle is humanism. Stalin was for... Stalin was for... Ugh, fuck. Stalin was forgetful in this way, and fell into both economism and humanism. Hence he fell, just as we were to do, in 1956, into certain traps prepared by the cunning of the bourgeoisie. The gulags, faked trials, and all that were bourgeois methods used against the bourgeoisie, and they backfired disastrously. disastrously. The trials and purges played a role determined in the last instance by the class struggle inside the USSR, even if in practice their victims were the wrong ones. We will leave Mr. Locke there, wriggling on the floor, one foot behind his back, the other in his mouth. We've only introduced him for the purposes of light relief. This whole section has been awful. Theory is so much clearer than history. I've written it only out of compassion for the innocence of a post-Stalinist generation. One day or the other, they would have to be told. I have tried to unravel a tangled skin to explain the function of Althusserianism as an ideological police action against any fundamental socialist critique of Stalinism, but a police action which presents itself through a series of distorting mirrors as exactly such a critique. I hope that I may have dispelled these illusions in two or three minds. But even if doubtfully convinced, these minds will still propose further questions, as they should. They may ask, why do you drag us back into all this old stuff? The sins were committed long ago in another country, and anyway, the wench is dead. 
they have all been confessed. And Eurocommunism is a thoroughly reformed character. Why should we of a post-Stalinist generation be haunted by our memories? My answer may be brief or extended. The brief answer is this. You are not a post-Stalinist generation. You are a generation amongst whom the reasons and legitimations of Stalinism are, by means of theoretical practice, being reproduced every day. We may now extend this answer. The agenda presented to each generation is always, in good part, presented to it by the past. My socialist generation was not responsible for fascism or, or for Stalinism. We found these already there when we came of age. We dealt with the first and we neglected for too long the second. Hence, it was transmitted as perhaps the largest of all problems to socialists today. We must distinguish, as with all such phenomena, between between Stalinism as a particular historical, political, sociological eventuation and the ideology, institutions, and practices which arose within that particular moment of eventuation. Stalinism, in the first sense, certainly belongs to the past. It was not cunningly planned, nor, as Althusser and Locke appear to suppose, was it the outcome of some deviation in theory, some momentary lapse in Stalin's theoretical rigor. It was the product of baffled human agency within a desperate succession of contingencies and subject to the severe determinations of Soviet history. This very difficult examination must be pursued in its own right. At a certain point, Stalinism may be seen as a systematic social formation with a consonant ideological logic and legitimation, Marxism, Leninism, Stalinism. Thus, from his historical matrix, there emerged Stalinism in a second sense. Stalinism was not just certain errors or unsatisfactory practices, which after some 20 years, even Althusser is able to call crimes. We are not only, please remember, just talking about some millions of people, and most of these the wrong people, being killed or gulagged. We are talking about the deliberate manipulation of the law, the means of communication, the police and propaganda organs of a state to blockade knowledge, to disseminate lies, to slander individuals about institutional procedures, which confiscated from the Soviet people all self-activating means, whether in democratic modes or in forms of workers' control, which substituted the party for the party, or sorry, which substituted the party for the working class, the party's leaders or leader for the party, and the security organs for all. About the confiscation and centralization of all intellectual and moral expression into an ideological state orthodoxy, that is, not only the suppression of the democratic and cultural freedoms of individuals, this even Euro-communism has come to regret, and we are glad that this is so, Although, even in the moment of regretting, it is sometimes implied that these freedoms of individual dissent are extras, additions to the menu of socialist construction, which after 60 years the Soviet state should be able to afford. It is not only this, but within the confiscation of individual rights to knowledge and expression, we have the ulterior confiscation of the processes of communication and knowledge formation of a whole people without which neither Soviet workers nor collective farmers can know what is true nor what each other thinks. From this historical matrix, there emerged Stalinism as a set of institutions and practices. Along with these, there emerged the apologia, the theoretical legitimation of the practice. Spreading outwards from the Soviet Union through the common turn, this permeated the entire international communist movement. The practices and the ideology were replicated, and the agents of this replication, the inner and trusted bureaucracies of national communist parties, became, by a very exact analogy, the priesthood of a universal church, adept at theological apologetics and humanistic homiletics, directly and knowingly deceiving their own memberships, agile in cas casuistry, and reinforcing their control by distinctively Stalinist procedures and forms. Democratic centralism, the suppression of faction and discussion, the exclusive control of the party's political, theoretical, and, as far as possible, intellectual organs, 
the slander of critics and opponents, and the covert manipulation of fellow travelers in front of organizations. And, sorry, in front organizations. It is not true that international communism did not know about Stalinism prior to the 20th Congress of the CPSU. It both knew a great deal and endorsed it, and it did not wish to know about the rest, and denounced this as slander. What it did not know was that it was now correct to denounce as the crimes of one man what it had previously exalted and apologized for in the language of Marxist theory. It will be seen that I am, as Novi Murr and Althusser predicted of socialist humanism, falling back upon the most violent bourgeois anti-communism and Trotskyist anti-Stalinism. But at least I am not hopping like a kangaroo. Every single point in the last two paragraphs is abundantly documented and not only in the works of scholars who may conveniently be ruled out of court as bourgeois hacks, bourgeois hacks, but by Soviet and socialist authors like Victor Serge, um, Ditcher, Lewin, Claudin, Medvedev. Some part of it I can confirm by direct experience. Members of a post-Stalinist generation who have agonized over Balabar and Lacan but who have not acquainted themselves with the elementary history of socialism in this century might postpone their theoretical practice until they have dried themselves behind the ears. But if I may speak for my generation for the moment of total contestation within Stalinism, that is between Stalinism and alternative communist traditions and forms, which was most manifest in 1956, then two important reservations must be entered. First, we never for one moment said or supposed that this was all that inter international communism was, or is, or was doing in those decades. Communists can never be reduced to agents of a Stalinist conspiracy. They were doing a hundred other things, many were important and within an alternative, authentic socialist tradition. Some were heroic and some of them no one else would do. This is one reason why the contestations within communism have been so sharp. Second, in our contestation with Stalinism, we never allowed to lapse for one moment our contestation with capitalism and with Western imperialism. Not only this, but we never relapsed into the dishonest attempt to divorce Stalinism from its historical genesis and emergency and contingency. Emergencies and contingencies supplied in good part by the furious hostility of international capitalism at the emergence of any socialist society. We never supposed that Stalinism was to be attributed in its origin to this or that theoretical error, nor to the innate evil will of Marxism, nor that analysis was ended by clucking our tongues in moral disapproval. We always saw international capitalism as a co parsoner in socialist degeneration. But that it was a profound degeneration in actuality, in thought, and in organizational forms, we had no doubt. To combat this degeneration was the agenda which history passed down to us. The generation of 1956 did not say that God had failed. We said that we had failed and that we meant to clear that failure up. And so, is not that moment still far in the past? And perhaps we succeeded. For many of that old Stalinist priesthood have died or been pensioned off. Sorry, but many of that old Stalinist priesthood have died or been pensioned off. Contingencies and contexts have changed. In what we had supposed to be the corpse of international communism, movement can be seen once again. It breathes and stirs its limbs. Perhaps the critique of 1956 was too precipitate, too, too passionate, too purist, but it was not altogether wrong. In mysterious ways and through the basic instincts of the proletarian organism, communism is proving capable of self-reform. Euro-communism has left Stalinism long behind. It has passed resolutions against it. Althusser is pursuing a theoretical critique. Some part of this is so, and that part is welcome. We have never supposed that Stalinism penetrated equally to all parts of the international movement nor have we ever proposed that communism in which we also invested so many of our thoughts and acts was an insanitary area. There is movement. There is even genuine self-questioning, real discussion, dialogue. It moves at different paces here and there. With Italian communism, 
which contained in Gramsci a moment of theoretical honor. It is moved in interesting ways. It is even moved in France. And Mr. Marchais, as we know, has promised that when he comes to power, he will be kind to animals. My cat, who read this over my shoulder, laughed, but I did not laugh. I think that in certain favorable contingencies, and recalling above all the libertarian traditions of the French and Italian peoples, expressing themselves within the membership of these mass parties and imposing their will upon the leaderships, given all this, the outcome of communist participation in governments of the left might be one which opened new and more democratic socialist possibilities. All this is possible as historical eventuation. But this does not mean that the project of 1956 has been fulfilled. For even if we take the most generous view of these changes and the most optimistic view of future tendencies, this project can only be fulfilled on one condition, that the agenda of 1956 is carried through to the bitter end. Of course, Stalinism as historical eventuation belongs to the past. It will not come back in that form the future will eventuate in other ways. And of course, there are plenty of opportunistic reasons why Western communist parties wish that the smell of the past would go away. <coughs> it is an electoral inconvenience that Solzhenitsyn should appear in the capitalist press every other day. No one wanted gulags to happen, and no one, certainly not Mr. Marchais, wants them to happen in France. Stalinism belongs to the past. We are already moving on. And yet, does it belong to the past? For it was not only a particular historical eventuation, but also one of the ultimate disasters of the human mind and conscience. A terminus of the spirit, a disaster area in which every socialist profession of good faith was blasted and burned up. And if one was bred in that area, hopping about and proclaiming it to be utopia, does one get out of it by only a few more opportunist hops? So let us stop playing the generation game. If we consider Stalinism in its second sense as a set of institutional forms, practices, abstracted theories, and dominative, dominative attitudes, then the post-Stalinist generation has not yet been born. Stalinism in this sense gave to us the agenda of the present and its forms and modes weigh like an alp on the brains of the living. And the living, never mind which generation, neither combined strength to shift that alp. If you had an alp on your mind, you will know that it is not removed by a theoretical shrug of the shoulders. Economism, humanism. I do not only mean that the Soviet Union, the largest alp of ale, is governed by practices and legitimated by state ideology. Marxism, which is directly derivative from Stalinism. I may safely predict that over the next 20 years, we will have sufficient lurid reminders of that, that the multiform self-assertions of the Soviet people will more often than not appear as a nausea with the party and its ideology, and that Mr. Marshall will meet with repeated electoral disappointments. I do not only mean that enigmatic China revives year by year more disturbing memories, that when the country's most respected leaders and Marxist clairvoyants become overnight a gang of four, we do not understand what is happening, but we do not know or but we do know that neither we nor the Chi Chinese people will be told, and we remember uneasily previous exposures of traitors at the peaks of power. Nor do I only mean that there are certain continuities in the personnel, forms, procedures, vocabulary, strategies, and methods of reformed Euro-Communist parties, continuities which may be modified by opportunist measures, but which very often may not be subjected to a sustained and principled critique, unless by an enemy of the party. I have asked my cat, and he has explained that it is all this which made him laugh, but there is still something more than all these. It has been throughout the subject of this essay. Stalinism, in its second sense and considered as theory, was not one error, not even two errors, which may be identified, corrected, and theory thus reformed. Stalinism was not absent-minded about crimes. It bred crimes. In the same moment that Stalinism emitted humanist rhetoric, humanist in quotation marks, 
It occluded the human faculties as part of its necessary mode of respiration. Its very breath stank and still stinks of inhumanity because it has found a way of regarding people as the bearers of structures, kulaks, and history as a process without a subject. It is not an admirable theory flawed by errors. It is a heresy against reason, which proposed that all knowledge can be summated in a single theory of which it is the sole arbiter and, gar and guardian. It is not an imperfect science, but an ideology suborning the good name of science in order to deny all independent rights and authenticity to the moral and imaginative faculties. It is not only a compendium of errors, it is a cornucopia out of which new errors ceaselessly flow, mistakes in correct lines. Stalinism is a distinct ideological mode of thought, a systematic theoretical organization of error for the reproduction of more error. All this I could see even if unclearly as the smoke was rising above Budapest. Thousands of others in a thousand different places could see the same. I itemized the errors of Stalinist theory one by one, the dictatorship of the proletariat in its Stalinist version, the military vocabulary, the theory of the party, and the mechanical theory of human consciousness is wrong. The theory that historical science can become as precise a science as, let us say, biology. The subordination of the imaginative and moral faculties to political and administrative authority is wrong. The fear of independent thought, the mechanical personification of unconscious class forces, all this is wrong. And I identified all the reproductive organs of all this teeming error. The Stalinist mode of thought is that of mechanical idealism, and we must view Stalinism as an ideology, a constellation of partisan attitudes and false or partially false ideas, establishing a system of false concepts within a mode of thought which, in the Marxist sense, is idealist. Finally, I identified Stalin's own claim to preeminence as practitioner of this system. He was not only, as had recently been discovered on his birthday, the greatest Marxist, greatest philosopher, greatest linguist, etc., but he was also the greatest kangaroo. For an idealist mode of this kind must, of necessity, through its imperviousness through empirical discourse, repeatedly reproduce mistakes and wrong results. The Stalinist oscillates between the axiom and real politic, dogmatism and opportunism. When the axioms cease to produce results, a mistake is recognized. But the cornucopia from which mistakes flow in such abundance is never recognized. Hop, dialectical materialism. Hop, theoretical practice. Bump. At the end of that high theoretical exercise, Khrushchev's secret speech. Yes, all of this thousands of us could see, but we could not finally identify the organization of Stalin's theoretical structure. This was not only owing to our own incompetence, it was also because that structure and its pure theoretic beauty and conceptual coherence had not yet been made. For Stalin was a mixture of Marxist theorist, pragmatist, and hypocrite. Some bits of the system he had time to attend to, the superstructure is created by the basis precisely in order to serve it. But it was full of rents and holes, which he patched up with humanist rhetoric, rule of thumb decisions, and security decrees. It is only in our own time that Stalinism has been given its true, rigorous, and totally coherent theoretical expressions. This is the Althusserian orary. I do not wish to be ungenerous to a post-Stalinist generation but it is necessary to be plain. Theoretical practitioners are familiar with the central concept of Marx, that a given productive system not only produces commodities, it also reproduces itself, its productive relations and its ideological forms and legitimations. These in their turn become a necessary condition for the process of reproduction. Stalinism as ideology has continued to reproduce itself long after the particular historical moment of high Stalinism has passed. And so long as it does so, in theory, it will tend to reproduce itself in fact, not in exactly the same form, of course, but in a form sufficiently uncomfortable for its human objects, 
and even for some of the intellectuals who serve as its priests. So far from being a post-Stalinist generation, the Althusserians and those who share their premises and idealist modes are working hard every day on the theoretical production line of Stalinist ideology. In terms of theory, they are the Stalinists. They are the carriers of those reasons of rationality and inhumanity, inhumanity against which we drew up the agenda of 1956. But this is passion over near ourselves, reality too close and too intense, and mingled up with something in my mind of scum and condemnation personal. And the patient post-Stalinist reader who has followed me this far will still have other questions on his mind. Well, and did you people with your agenda correctly identify the theoretical sources of Stalinism? What came of it all? Did you construct a better theory? I will answer these questions and conclude.